Call the meeting to order. It is the uh, regular meeting of the Dinah School Board, June 13th, 2016. We do have a quorum. I did call that to order. Rick, can you kind of go through the agenda for us? Certainly can. Uh, we have um, review of the regular board meeting on May 16th, as well as the uh, special meeting on June 3rd. At that special meeting, we did accept the graduate list. We had a very successful graduation on June 4th. The board also made a minor change in our guiding change plan for the gifted and talented uh, guiding change document where we added uh, uh, within that options team or the study team uh, some representation both from uh, teachers as well as the parent community. And then there was a brief leadership update uh, discussing my performance pay which action occurs later at. Uh, as for today, uh, we uh, have no hearing from the audience. We do have a consent agenda. This is that end of the year agenda so it's quite lengthy, the superintendent's performance goals, the annual alt comp, we'll hear a report on that. We've got health and safety budgets, uh, approving our health and safety consultant, lease agreements uh, up here uh, at the community center, our food service agreement, a variety of purchases um, that will take us through. We also are continuing to move forward with best buy on agreement, the rate to pay for our summer help gifts then uh, as we move to leadership the report and discussion we'll do a leadership update as well as the next gen pilot projects is in tennis and will give us a report on that and has some guests with us tonight um, the board committee some actions there we've got policy work as well that uh, the committee has done over the past month then our action items will be approving the middle school schematics the public bid process for the elementaries are going back to rebid on that preliminary pre preliminary budget we'll have margo bach present on that long-term uh, facilities maintenance budget as well and then our early childhood uh, recommendations uh, Val Burke and I will report on that uh, and then we have a variety of policies again that we're moving through and that will conclude the agenda for tonight's meeting great thank you very much the first item is approval of the minutes we have a regular meeting of May 16th and a special meeting of June 3rd can I get a motion please so moved. Second. second are there any corrections to the minutes Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next was hearing from members of the audience. We do not have <clears throat> any members of the audience tonight who are speaking. The next is the consent item. We do have a, uh, a walk-in change on the superintendent's performance goal pay. Can I get a motion to substitute the walk-in with the one that's in the agenda currently? So moved. Second. Any discussion, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next, we do have the, now have the consent agenda. Um, I think Ricky have already walked us through it. Does anybody have anything that they want removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, yes? May I just ask a question on one item? Sure. attached and I was just curious if I was supposed to use the cost that was above those two so the Lenovo um, oh I always go to quick view but it's your your attachment to under your item oh are those included in the price above is that how I just wanted to verify that I wasn't misinterpreting it that's all uh, thank you very much uh, good evening Board of Education that's exactly right this year unlike in the past years the warranty is included in the price of the Chromebook. So I wanted to try to make sure that I identified what that price was, and it includes both the device and a three-year accidental warranty for that device. So underneath it, it said to include the following devices plus warranty. So I caught, I tried to add both of those devices in there, I'm try just, to make it clear. I figured that's what you meant, but I just wanted to double check. So thank you so much for that. So uh, no request to remove anything from the consent agenda. Uh, did I already get a motion to approve the consent agenda? No. So moved to bring it to the floor. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next are reports and discussion. There was a request to switch the order and have next gen pilot projects go first. I would ask uh, Susan um, Tennyson to come forward. Susan's been coordinating our pilot projects for the past three years. She also has a couple guests that she'll be bringing forward to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, we thank Susan for her leadership work on the pilot projects. I think the third year, Susan, we've been doing various pilot projects as we yes. roll our strategic plan forward, and yes. we welcome you tonight. Thank you. 
Good evening, school board members and the community and Dr. Dressen. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening in reference to our next-gen next pilots. And as soon as I get this show going, here we go. All right, so um, as you know, we have had pilots for the last several years, um, initially with our secondary program and this year with our BG5 program. And we are happy to share some of the results this evening from our pilot learning across the BG5 program. Um, we have provided our colleagues who engaged in pilots with significant support throughout the year to ensure that we had um, metrics in place, support they needed for completing their reports, their financial obligations, and our office um, met regularly with these staff as well as on demand. A number of metrics were used for the pilots and they are pilot dependent. So we will be taking a look at some qualitative data as well as some quantitative data. Um, and the reports that were submitted by our pilot leaders actually were quite comprehensive. And uh, I have to commend all of our colleagues who are pilot leaders this year for the reporting efforts they made and the significant amount of data they collected, analyzed, and reported to support the learning. This year, we have actually two sets of um, leaders who are here this evening to share their learning with you. Um, and so I would like to introduce Kate Perardi and Paul Tesmertuck. Um, both teachers submitted the um, application for a personalized learning for all pilot. And I um, can assure you that their learning has been significant this year, and they are here to share a little bit of that with you. So I'll invite them to come forward. Hello, board and Dr. Dressen. Thank you so much for having us today and letting us share our work with you. And we just wanted to start by thanking you for supporting us last year and letting us explore and really dig into our passion. Again, thank you, Susan, for helping us along the process starting way back to our application last year. We also want to thank Deb Richards, Erica Watson, they are members of our team and they gave us a lot of support along the way, as well as Countryside Fifth Grade team members who you can see on the screen and Cornelia. Cornelia fifth grade team members for just embracing this change and giving it their all throughout the year. Um, so our summary points just to kind of give you an overview before we start. Um, so the fifth grade teachers at two schools use the gradual release of responsibility and they move to a, from a real teacher directed model to a more learner directed model. Um, the fifth grade learners use things like Google Classroom um, they created websites and had actually an online e-portfolio where they put um, links to their work, most of which was done in Google. And then um, Kate and I, the GT reading specialist, served as coaches to kind of work them through the process and kind of be on-demand um, coaches for them as we went along. So our overall goals were to increase teacher and student knowledge of the standards and the learning competencies. Also to really inc increase the learner engagement and have them excited about what was happening in the classroom and have their voice in what they're doing and why they're doing it. We also wanted them to be able to increase their mastery of the standards and show that in evidence in their learning portfolios. And increase their reading map and MCA test scores. Um, so to get started, what we did, along with a couple of our colleagues, um, we created a summer workshop and we um, boiled that basically down into one eight hour day with um, fifth grade learn with fifth grade teachers, excuse me. Um, and really our goals were these three to really teach teachers about the standards so they could then um, teach their students to learn about growth mindset as opposed to fixed mindset and then really teach them how to move from that that gradual release from a teacher-directed model to a more learner-directed model. Um, and then after that, teachers were given um, a one-day um, pay to plan on their own and kind of plan together and use the resources that we gave them. 
So the first step of our whole process was really to create that classroom culture of achievement and the growth mindset. Both schools did this in a different way depending on their environment. So responsive class, classroom, the CARES value, um, workflow was something that we received in January and February by Mark Wallace. Also organi organization and goal setting were a big part in the beginning to make sure the learners knew that their learning was going to continue and it didn't matter how smart they thought they were. Everyone can keep learning and keep growing and succeeding and meeting their goals. So after we created a, they created a real positive learning environment then teachers started to really focus on the standards, which were the learning targets and the Minnesota um, state reading standards. Um, and we gave those to students, which they put on their own website. Here's just an example of the I Read Fiction, which are essentially the um, fifth grade reading standards. And the third step was to, like Paul mentioned earlier, the gradual release of responsibility. So not just throwing them in there right away. There's the targets, good luck. We really started at the beginning, gradually letting, adding in their voice, starting with mini lessons. And as through the end of the year, some of the learners were at learner driven, but some of them were still at teacher, -driven, teacher centered. So it just depended on the learner and where they were in that gradual release. So, um, all the teachers followed that responsibility and as they went through the year, the learners started to understand the reading <laughs> targets a lot more because in the beginning in September, they're very used to the teacher just telling them what to do and just read this, do that, but not sure why. So by the end of the year, the teachers filled out a survey for us and they felt that the learners knew more based on the learners rating themselves on each learning target that they could understand what they were and explain them to someone else. And the last component we really um, shared with teachers and they um, did with their students was a lot of assessment ahead of time to see what they knew based on the standards. Um, and then really did a lot of rubrics and summative assessments. And from that information, we, um, they coached individual students um, to meet their learning needs. So like Kate said, a lot of students were still in a somewhat teacher-directed model, but many students were also just being coached and working on their own and designing their own learning. Um, and we found that um, the feedback was a really essential component of the personalized learning experience for students, and teachers found that they were doing a lot more, had a lot more opportunities to give feedback and really knew their students a lot better by the end of this process. Um, and here's just a quick example of what the iRead portfolio, one page of it, would look like um, for a student. So as w at the end of the year came in May, we asked the teachers, so what did you think? Do you want to continue this? How do you see this moving forward? And it was very desirable that they want to try to continue this as we roll out the new making meeting making meaning reading curriculum. They want to figure out how they can still implement some of the things they use this year. They want to get better at the gradual release model. They want to continue to support and adjust the new groups of students in their classrooms and continue to relate the work in reading and start to move it towards math and with that growth mindset idea and allowing them to really teach. It freed up a lot of their time to really teach, focus on the kids and focus on their goals. And some teacher thoughts that they had, I can let you read these, but um, they found that it was really essential to kind of go slowly, a little bit at a time. Um, and really, they took time to prepare, teach, and reflect. And having a team of four fifth grade teachers per building was really essential um, for them to really going about this both slowly and then moving at a good pace for their students. Um, and then some things that, one thing that really came out of it was that they, teachers weren't just using those things we had taught them. They were, as Kate said, applying this to math. They were um, starting what's called a genius hour where they do research type projects. So teachers were really embracing this and applying it to other areas of um, education for students and really embracing personalized learning in all areas. So in our final report document, we have about 11, recommend, 11 to 13 recommendations, but this is just a summary of them, um, really providing teachers with more planning time. They really wanted to work together more than the schedule allowed them. 
provide resources, including training and coaching, and provide an information system to allow for self-pacing, e-portfolios, and access to the resources, which as we're getting trained this summer and into August about Schoology, that could be a great tool that we might be able to use moving forward. And right. Any questions? Uh, sort of as a part of the process and sort of can you talk about a little bit about maybe a teacher who was resistant and, and what sort of what what that change how that change came about um, I can address that um, one of our staff was definitely had kind of she said you know been in education a long time been there done that seen all the cycle of different things come around um, and so she was one, I think part of this is it's a personalized process for teachers, and some teachers went really quickly, uh, embraced it really quickly, and others were more reluctant. And I think by the end of the year, teachers who were reluctant really saw the value um, of really giving students more choice in their learning and saw the value of them designing their own learning because they were both engaged in the content more and learning more. And so this teacher said, by the end, it, she felt like, it freed her up to really teach like she wanted to teach and she felt really passionate about what she was doing so um, I think that experience was really helpful for her and just to add to that we started in the summer and we had that training we started saying we're not expecting you to be all the way at the end by the by May we just want to see how far you get trying anything new is going to be awesome and we just want to see how that impacts your learners so they all had different goals and were at different spots by the end Could you speak a little more to the measurement rubric and how you would compare students who had the opportunity to participate in this pilot with students who, and their growth, who were not a part of this pilot? Um, I think one thing we really noticed is just the motivation of learners to really be engaged, to have some choice. Um, just over the years, as I've been doing this, I've been amazed at how just if you give students a simple choice of what to read or something, the motivation just skyrockets. And learning is so tied to that motivational piece. I think that's been really um, crucial for that. So that's one piece. We're still waiting for MCA data from the state to be kind of normed and everything. Um, and students um, overall mm -hmm. showed solid map gains. And I think um, we're not quite ready to show that yet. That's still being sorted out too. But um, Students showed um, solid growth in those areas too. Thank you. Kate and Paul, thank you for your extra efforts in bringing this concept uh, to life for us. We've mm -hmm. talked a lot about it and studied a lot, but this is one of those key pilots, I think, that is uh, a difference maker and really going to help us advance uh, our strategic work around making a more personalized learning for all of our students. So thank you. Can I just ask, so how many students were involved in these pilots total, and how many teachers? All the fifth grade students at Cornelia and Countryside, and that would be eight teachers, four at Countryside and four at Cornelia. So yeah, approximately 200 students and eight teachers, mm -hmm. and then the two of us as coaches. Were there only five teachers that participated in the responses? Yeah. 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 So we sent it out at the end of the year when the to-do list of teachers was enormous, so we could not get all of them to respond. Gotcha. Okay. And then, Mike, chance, oh. sorry. No. Do, do we ask these questions of mm -hmm. a control group, maybe the fifth grade teachers at other schools, about some of their, you know, what, how much do they get one-on-one -on -one feedback? So we have a comparison of whether it's really the personalized learning or if it's just fifth grade teachers or I'm just trying to think yeah. if we have people who are resistant at doing personalized learning and we don't have a comparison group it's hard to convince them that this is maybe the way to go if if we don't have a control group yeah we that was not part of our pilot okay. we did assess students at the beginning of the year and then at the end of the year um, so we do have the kind of before and after results okay. but we didn't um, compare that to students in other schools can you speak to um, potential resistance in the students in changing, since these are fifth graders, not first, first graders, um, how, how did they take to taking more control versus I'm used to the teacher always telling me what to do and I just do it? Um, what, what kind of reactions did you get from the kids? 
So at first, a lot of it is technology-based, so technology is a big piece that some of the learners struggle with at first because they just want, ooh, this cool font, or oh, I want this feature instead of what they actually learned. So that was a big challenge for them at first because they're used to technology being for gaming or fun things, so teaching them that the technology is a tool to help show their learning was one of the biggest things that the countryside teachers talked about and had conversations about, as well as not being done so in order to get feedback, so lots of the kids would say, I'm done, but how can we make that better? What can we do to improve? What can we do to take this to the next level? Was a really big thing that some of the kids didn't understand right away as we tried to move them from the fixed mindset to the growth mindset. Nice. Were there more than four questions to the teachers, these surveys at the end? <laughs> yeah, we had a, a few more questions. What do we have, maybe eight or nine? Um, but we thought those were the most significant, and we can share that data with you if you Yeah, like. I'd appreciate it. Are any other quotes? It's hard to make, I guess, sense of some of it. You know, there was a question about did students' understanding of the reading targets increase since September, and I don't know what a good response would be or how it would compare to classes that weren't in the personalized learning program. We got a couple of three out of fives and some four out of fives, so I don't know what to make of that, if that's mm -hmm. amazing or if that's average or... You know? And then I just had a question. You mentioned a little bit on, I don't know what slide it was. It was the sort of moving from teacher-centered to learner-driven. And you mentioned that at the end, some kids were still more here. And some, do you have a sense of where the kids, how many were at each level by the end, just in terms of when we're looking towards moving forward with personalized learning, how many of our kids were able to move Faster or not faster, but just how many kids were at it at the, those stages? Just so we have an idea of what it might look like at other sites. Right, yeah, I think there was quite a bit of variability. And part of that is some kids are just more ready to work on their own. They come to school with those skills. Um, so part of what, some of our work that we did with Mark Wallace was, um, aside from developing the growth mindset, those autonomy skills that they'll need to develop in order to devise their own learning and really master the standards. Um, so I think that was an important part, in the, but there was quite a bit of variability. And even the two of us, we are working also with our um, GT readers, and we still see a lot of variability, even with those students that we've been working with, with for two years. And part of that is the personalized learning. Some students, it works better for them to have more direct instruction mm -hmm. or maybe to watch a teacher on video or something like that. And some kids, it's a better fit for them, um, personalized learning, to be going more on their own. So you're gonna, I think we're always gonna see some variability depending on the needs of the students. So that's, I think, part of the broad kind of look of personalized learning. So if I was to go into the classroom, give me like three things that I would see different in this personalized learning environment versus the prior environment? Um, well, one thing you would definitely see is everybody, well, not everybody, many kids are doing many different things, working on technology, working on paper, working in groups, working individually. So you're going to see them working on different things as they, especially towards the end of the year, we found that um, teachers had students working on different things at different times depending on if they'd mastered a skill already and were ready to move on to something else, or if they were um, you know, working, maybe had to add more work, add more details to some work, things like that. So um, you're gonna see a lot of kids doing different things. Anything you wanna You'd add? also see a lot of feedback, a learner going up to another learner, hey, do, Paul, do you have time to look at this and tell me two things you like and one thing you think I could work on? You'd also see the student or the teacher calling a student back to either get feedback on an evidence or to have a mini lesson about a skill that the teacher has identified from a pre-assessment that they need more help with. So mini lessons based on the pre-assessment data and feedback happening. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank thank you for you. your questions and for having us. So Paul and Kate provided some insight into their experience with our oldest elementary <laughs> age students. And now I'm really happy um, to introduce Angela Gatke and Margie Galvin, who worked with our youngest elementary age students, our kindergartners. And they are going to share their experience um, with what 
was initially called Genius Hour, but I believe you're going to learn they um, perhaps changed the name as a result of their experience. So. <coughs> right, good evening. Is it on? Yeah, you're on. You're good. Okay. You're good. We're live. We're live. All right. So we had quite the adventure in kindergarten this year. And um, tonight we're going to just share with you some of the key objectives of our, of our pilot, how we implemented it, some projects, results, and some conclusions and recommendations. Excellent. I'm trying to get this to look a little better, but or show up. <laughs> okay, so some key of key objectives we had. I'm not going to go word by word because we have a lot to tell you here. But um, the key things that stuck, stood out for us as we were planning this is we wanted to focus on students' divergent thinking and building that, personalizing learning. We wanted to focus on problem solving and communication skills, as well as working collaboratively collaboratively and taking ownership in their work and viewing themselves as creators and collaborator collaborators collaborators collaborators. Thank you. Yeah. Um, which sounds familiar to you because a lot of what we just talked about is comes up in the next generation competencies um, that Edina is working towards. So um, a lot of the things we just mentioned are listed here. So as we're talking, you'll kind of hear little tidbits of that as we go through um, what happened in our classrooms. And uh, we had to come up with a term to use with the kids. And so throughout our brainstorming, we came up with SPARKS. And the acronym is Students Pursuing Passions and Projects, Actively Researching, Redesigning, Constructing, Creating, collaboratively, Collaborating to Build Knowledge and Share Their Learning. And when Spark showed up on the daily schedule, kids were excited. They were ready. So in the fall, we really focused on building the mindset um, of this project. So we read a lot of books that um, had characters that had these different um, competencies. And we did a lot of open-ended projects down here. Um, you see kindergartners on the second day of school approaching an open-ended project um, in a team. Um, during the fall, students also started to interact and work with their um, Seesaw journal, which allowed them to document their learning and share their learning with an audience outside the classroom. Um, and we also participated in Dot Day, which is kind of a global um, focus on creativity that lots of different schools participate in. Uh, the winter took us into some engineering projects. We did a gingerbread boat engineering where the kids had to figure out using a variety of materials how to get the gingerbread man across the water uh, so that the fox didn't get him. And through that, there was a lot of ref reflecting, having to go back and redesign. Um, kids having a process of kind of deciding how they were going to construct before they did and then trying out their their patterns and then their designs. So this is one example mid. That one time I just had a bone in my old school and it was had lots of stuff on and it would sink because it's heavy. I know you scared a fluke but not all the way. We have to fix up the well, it moves with our hands and get wet so we're going to fix it. It's hard to understand, but there's a group of three that are in mid-process and they're describing why their boat didn't work. So, um, Also in the winter, we had students, we gave them a survey so they could kind of do some self-reflection on themselves as a learner and we took part in a dramatic play area project where they were designing um, and voting on what they were going to turn a dramatic uh, role play area into. And um, during that process, sorry, going to here. Yeah. We also then um, had the kids do a cardboard challenge, which was based off of the Kane's Arcade 
and it's a little boy out in East LA who created his own video arcade out of cardboard boxes. We showed the kids that video, and they in turn built an arcade. And um, our older book buddies came and played all the arcade games. And as a result from that, the money that we raised, we used to buy cake mixes and frostings for the food shelf. So the kids utilize the purpose of how can they make someone else's day happy. And um, it, was, it was by far one of the most empowering activities we did this year. This is kind of what it looked like when they invited the fourth grade buddies down. So the kindergartners are um, leading their games that they've created. They had to design a game and write rules of how it was played and how many tickets it would be um, and all sorts of things like that. So this is just kind of a look of what, what it looks like in the classroom when this is, this is taking place. But obviously um, the kindergartners are leading the way, not the fourth graders, which is, is huge in their little world as well. Um, and then as we continue to work with this project, one of the, the big takeaways that we both noticed throughout the process was that students were talking a lot differently. Um, and that was really apparent after they did some reflection after this cardboard challenge. Um, and it was literally at the end of the day one day and I, we were getting ready to go and we had done it that day and I, I just asked the kids like, what did you learn from this project? And most kindergartners in years past would say, we built stuff. We um, did this thing, um, we, had, we fun. had fun, you know, very literal um, reactions and maybe just a retelling of what they actually did step by step. Um, but this is what our students had to say and hopefully the audio will work. Today we opened our kindergarten arcade and we learned lots of things from this project. What's something that you learned? Um, I learned how to make stuff and how to think of stuff to make. It's okay for things to be tough. It's okay for things to be tough? Learn how to create. We didn't give up. We didn't give up. It didn't turn out the right time. You mean it didn't turn out right the uh, first time? Yeah. Um, don't push or shove because then the thing won't work. So we had to learn to work together nicely. Give up. Don't give up. That's a good Don't lesson. Don't learn how to get lots of people to come to our arcade and it was fun. And what was our big wonder wall question we were investigating? Why? How can we help hungry children on special days? That's right. How can we help hungry children celebrate special days? So again, that was connected to what we had done at Countryside in regards to Countryside Against Hunger. Yeah, and um, in the spring, we introduced what was a, called a wonder wall, where kids could just write questions and put them on the wonder wall, and then we would discuss them. And um, we talked about how sometimes your wonders can be really big. And from that, we then um, took 10 of the wonders, and the kids got to pick which one they wanted to investigate. And um, it was this was the one piece of the process that we found a little overwhelming because it le needed a lot more teacher direction, a lot more teacher preparation and materials um, because it was so s individualized and more specific and having 10 groups of kids and trying to maneuver that at the same time was a little more complicated. Uh, we also went to the Works Museum to have um, more of that understanding of engineering and the process of design and um, the kids from that we participated in the Global Day of Design where kids once again use those engineering skills. And um, in the spring, we opened our ocean museum where students became an expert on an ocean animal and then they were responsible for basically thinking of a way that they were gonna teach and um, share about their animal which involved creating an exhibit and throughout our process of a couple of these different projects we were sharing outside of our classroom with our parents consistently but then um, my classroom started sharing some of their learning on a global blog as well so students from around the world could see that so when we look back at the results when we look at surveys from October to April and we ask the question the kids the same questions. Um, these are just some of our results that we're gonna fly through pretty quickly. But um, asking the students, it, I'm curious, I like to learn about things so you can see the difference in their responses from October to April. Looking at how they viewed themselves in terms of persistence, I can think of new ways to do things when I get stuck, how that has changed from October to April. 
I will try something even if I don't do it well. I know I can do many things. And I use my imagination. And then we didn't ask this in October, but we should have. Um, I can work well with other kindergartners. So this was their response in April. And then when we were discussing this project, we thought, oh my gosh, it would have been great if we would have had another kindergarten class. And then we did down and the hallway. So, so we did a control compared to the control group of kindergartners for the spring results. And um, what we found was quite interesting with our pilot group along with the control group where of, with persistence. Um, and also the next slide, um, trying to do something well, it, trying to do something even if I don't do it well. Uh, this slide really st stood out to us that there wasn't one child in Angela or my class that would, said they would never try something. Um, yep. And then also using the, the imagination, just you know how there were, there's, a, there's a distinct contrast. So we were, um, it suggests that students in the pilot group reported being more persistent, risk takers, and more creative. Um, lots of discussion. So just some key highlights here. Uh, students were highly engaged. I mean, they liked, I mean, it was like, are we doing Sparks today? Is it today? Are we doing Sparks? Is this happening today? They yeah. always wanted to know when that was happening. Uh, we found that large group project-based learning inquiries were more successful in terms of even though kids were doing a lot of things on their own and kind of doing their own path as a teacher, it was a little bit easier to bop around knowing where kids could be potentially. Um, students were creating digitally, sharing their learning with Seesaw. Um, they were embedding reflection and feedback and connecting with meaningful audiences outside the classroom. And that adult support in the room was, was huge. Yeah. Um, I know we had some adults in here in our classroom sometimes. They're like, couldn't you just get out a worksheet? Could you just pass that out instead? Um, and just the transition we made to from realizing, you know, the ideal of getting to a true genius hour thing in kindergarten, we, there's still some kinks to deal with that. And how do you make that work best with, you know, our littlest five and six year olds. But um, some definite conclusions that we had is with being intentional with, with key objectives really impacted how our students viewed themselves as learners. Um, you know, the language moved beyond that literal and showed more deep reflection on their process for their learning. Um, you know, they were, they were highly motivated and engaged when, and it were asking when that spark was happening. And we, we saw that energy carry over into other parts of their day. And even though it wasn't spark time, if it was explore time or tinker time, they were embedding those skills on their own independently. And the reflections and sharing was just really yep. big. So recommendations, so to continue to explore project-based learning and how to best support it with kindergartners. Um, and you know, again, having multiple adults in the room that know the students well was a key factor into just things kind of running smoothly too. And looking at the pilot too, you know, we had planned out what we thought we might allocate money towards, but we found a lot of, we spent a lot of time just collaborating yeah. together yeah. and just having some real in-depth discussions about how is this gonna, gonna take place and work. Um, and there's funding for supplies that we had, but I think, you know, pretty minimal yeah. in terms of what um, that cost is. So we, we have a really, really thorough plan that we've laid out that kindergartners, um, teachers in around the, around the district could take and kind of, you know. Use as a, use as a guide. As a map. Um, and then I think, you know, a key to this too was supporting technology tools for young learners that make it easy and accessible them, for them to share their learning was really impactful. Um, and just giving kindergarten, other kindergarten classrooms an opportunity to connect globally with peers. Um, my classroom did that um, to a larger extent, and mm -hmm. I think that was really powerful for them to connect with peers um, from around the globe, so. That's it. Any questions? Yeah, that was fabulous. I love how you included the control group versus your <laughs> the students in your classes. That was fascinating to seek and especially in our youngest learners entering the system. Um, and I hope that that develops those kids to continue to take those challenges and those classes all the way up through high school where they're not sure they're ready for it, but they want to try it anyway. 
Um, one of the things I was wondering about, you were talking about how the kids wanted to do sparks, and when even though it wasn't sparks, you were starting to see them embed it in other areas. How do you see that, especially for our emerging readers? Did it, did it allow the students to take a different approach to learning to read, something that could be challenging for some? You know, the one area where I saw a large growth, it was with writing. Oh, writing? With my kids. Um, because paper was out and you know I had some students who really have that had that creative flow and juices and uh, a student in particular who came in not even knowing all her letters or sounds of the alphabet and was just writing amazingly and it, it was signs and, and where it started where I started seeing her do those types of independent pursuing that, that skill independently was when <coughs> we were doing spark time and, and she was at the writing center all the time and asking about that. And she's going to have a cardboard arcade at a rummage sale this summer. And I, I would agree with that. And you know, it was interesting because a lot, a lot of the projects we did, there was a writing component just because it was necessary. They had to have a sign for their cardboard game. They had to write down the steps of how they were gonna play this cardboard game. You know, so kids that maybe during a formal writer's workshop time are like, oh, you know, they were like, okay, I gotta get my plan down before I go get my materials. So just having that purpose, real authentic purpose of why I'm doing this writing embedded, mm -hmm. I think was huge. And I noticed a lot too, and we mentioned this, but there was just a very different mindset with them being risk takers and persisting and persevering, which, you know, I told my kindergartners, I, adults huge. struggle with that, yeah. you know? So if they kind of have that sense of that at five is, is beneficial. And this also really empowered children who academically weren't strong with letters and reading mm -hmm. and things, but have that spatial sense. Mm -hmm. And I think back to the gingerbread boat experience mm -hmm. and I have who two children at that time who were non-readers really struggling with letters and sounds they had the most persistence in creating and spent the longest time and felt very successful and for me to empower them I mean they they walked out just so excited about learning that day because it was something that they really could do yeah. no that's great I would agree with everything Sarah said. So was this an hour? Like, how much time can you sort of give me just a sense of the week or once a week? Or how did so, that? So like an original model of a genius hour would be like an hour a week at a certain time. Um, but we, we found that at the beginning, we were, we were doing that as we were kind of planting the seeds of you know, this whole thing. Um, but then we found it a little bit easier to kind of do some groupings together. Like for example, during the cardboard challenge, it wasn't, it wasn't, re it didn't really make sense for kindergartners to say, we're gonna do this for an hour right now and then we're gonna put it away for a week. And you know, they were like, no, we need to get back to that. <laughs> so we kind of, depending on the project, sometimes it took place, you know, three times a week for 40 minutes and then maybe we wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be in that in depth for the next two weeks. But then with, it was, it kind of flowed depending on what, um, what it entailed. And it sounded like, and what the kids were excited about. So you, you guys were responding to their engagement. So, yes. Yeah, that yeah. was great. That was awesome. And that was throughout the year? Yes. Yeah. And how many kids, how many kindergartners? Uh, 22, then you had 21. 22. 21. So yeah. approximately 44. Great. 44. No, it's really the kind of thing we want kindergartners to be doing. Fun yeah. projects, some persistence, some teamwork. Uh, I had a question about the... I guess the comparison to the control group, I saw three questions to the control group. Were there only three or were there more So as those well? were the three that stuck out to us. Right. Um, they were asked all of the questions and the other ones we noticed, you know, they weren't that blatant. So, you know, we could, we could infer that maybe that's just how a kindergartner grows, that they, sure. you know, have maybe that growth. Um, obviously, <laughs> they were in our building. So, you know, they have similar similar teaching styles and approaches, so, um, but those were the three that really, really stuck out to us. And I forgot to ask this earlier with the other group, but uh, did you get a chance to partner with our Director of Research and Evaluation as you were coming up with questions that would evaluate whether this was a success, if it met the goals, or where to work on next year for further improvements? 
We should add that to our oh, list. Yeah. No, we talk, <laughs> we talk with Susan a lot, and she yeah. helped guide us in terms of what, you know, what would be a good measure, but okay. we could do that. That's exciting stuff. It's, it's extraordinary on every level. Thank you. It was also a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> You know, I think I think that was really exciting. I mean, I would run over to Margie and be like, "Oh my gosh, did you see this? How did it go for you?" You know, so I think just that um, spark, I think for us too, was just, you know, I think that's that's a big shift that can take place. Is the teacher isn't always in control, you know, and we had a game plan, but really, the driving force was the students and where they were going to take it. So, I think that's a big shift, but. I mean, what, what more could we ask for than, than our kids to have spark, but for our teachers to have mm -hmm. that too? Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, that's just, it's so overjoying to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great Thank work. You. Enjoy your summers. So as you can tell, there was a lot of energy around our pilots this year and significant learning um, for our students and for our staff. As we uh, look to evaluate what happens next with our BG5 pilots, we are looking for um, evidence of positive impact on the learner experience, um, learning that uh, opportunities for our students and for our staff align to our next generation educational competencies. And then the pilots that have outcomes that cl clearly support advancement of our next gen vision. So as we look at what are the next steps, we evaluate each of the pilots based on the report that has been submitted and there are three options. We either advance the pilot, meaning that we are we see evidence that it does support our educational competencies and our next gen vision. And we look at ways that we could potentially build that across a program, a grade level, a site, um, our district. Continued study where we perhaps need more information about those aspects of the student experience. And we also have the option to archive because we know as we enter a pilot, it is about learning and sometimes our learning suggests that the pilot was not a good fit or we did not um, and, uh, land with the intended outcomes. So for our BG5 pilots this year, we're looking to advance um, multiple pilots, gamification, um, the Genius Hour project-based learning, which we just heard about, and the personalized learning for all, which we also were lucky enough to hear about this evening. Um, Smart Pre-K, which is at our, excuse me, our um, preschool program and the school-wide PBIS, and then the World Savvy Classroom. All six of those pilots had very positive outcomes and we have data suggesting that there is um, reason to believe it's a positive learner experience and aligns with our next generation educational competencies. And our department would recommend that we continue to explore how to use this learning to advance our next gen um, Edina Public Schools. We also have three pilots that we are recommending continued study as there either was not um, a complete data set or there's some need for additional learning. And I'll pause here for questions that you might have. The other um, note that I would like to share is that our May term pilot in the second year, that report will be shared with you in July. Um, the data is still being compiled and analyzed. Um, Susan, will you be sharing the data with us that you have in these other areas? I know we got to see some of the data tonight, obviously, for mm -hmm. the two pilots where they presented but I'm wondering about the other ones. So we have a complete set of reports prepared by each of the pilot leaders and we will, I'm happy to share those. Great, thank so, you. You're welcome. There's great learning. And can I just ask, so I'm just a little, what does advanced mean? I'm not quite sure, does it mean we're, yeah, I'll just add, what does that mean? So the learning that was um, part of the pilot suggests that there is, um, at, at least parts of those pilots that could be implemented at a building level, a grade level. 
um, and to use utilize that learning to further our next generation um, Edina Public School. So there may be a piece, for example, with the Genius Hour. If we were, to use that as an example, we see tremendous evidence of increased learner engagement and ownership of their learning. Um, and uh, to utilize that and perhaps expand it across more kindergarten classrooms. Um, or perhaps there is a fourth grade class that would, or team that would like to engage in that kind of learning. To use the evidence we have, the learning that is already in place, to support another team in doing that work. Okay. And are you, um, I guess, moving forward, looking to work with Donna a little bit more is to, I guess, figure out what specific questions require what sort of data to really give us an idea of whether it's indicating a lot or not indicating a lot, if it's exciting or if it's average, because I'm having a hard time with some of the you know, figures we've been showing to knowing how to react to them. It's I appreciate your question. Yeah. There is so much of our pilot learning is really about gathering baseline data. And of course, we can, in hindsight, say, um, we maybe should have added that metric. Right. And so we use that learning as we move forward. So I anticipate if we are moving forward with another um, Genius Hour type pilot, we would definitely embed metrics for a control group. So, and that makes sense that we would do that. So um, I will be certainly consulting with my teaching and learning colleagues as we move forward. We, I feel we made significant improvements this year with the BG5 pilot and that process, the support that our teachers received and the expectations around the reporting. Um, and that was fueled by our learning last year with our secondary study and the secondary pilots. So piloting is um, almost a pilot in and of itself is constant learning and continuous improvement. Absolutely, you know, and it's naturally difficult with education anyway, so many different variables. True. I appreciate your efforts. Absolutely, thank you. Other questions? So very quickly, I will run through our um, recess study. Um, our district engaged in a study of our recess program across the six elementary sites this spring. And the purpose of the study was to gather baseline data again at all of our elementary sites um, to include the two sites that had a recess pilot in place earlier this year and to utilize that data to inform site-based decision making in terms of the recess experience for students and to ensure that regardless of the site that the recess experience aligned to vision. And our vision is articulated here. And we had multiple data sources as we gathered this information. Um, discipline referrals ju ju during the period of April 4th through April 15th, and our six elementary principals um, came to a, a, an agreement of what a disciplinary, a disciplinary referral would be that they would monitor. So it would not be a, a student being sent to the office just for a quick chat. It would be something that would require significant intervention. Health office referrals were monitored and tabulated from the beginning of the year through the end of spring break. And again, here we found that there are a variety of practices in the way that data is gathered and even how um, an injury might be defined. We reviewed the staffing model, gathered some info, input from our administrators in terms of strengths and challenges to their recess program from their perspective. And um, we also ran focus groups across the uh, sixth grade, excuse me, the six elementary sites. Baseline data, and I will not spend a lot of time on this this evening. Um, our elementary principals will be using this data to ascertain next steps and how to inform the recess experience. I would like to note on this slide, if you look at Concord, you can see that they're at 100%. And what that means is that of their two discipline referrals during that two week period, both of them were recess related. So this slide is indicating of the referrals during that two week period, how many of them were recess related. So Health office visits. Quick, quick question. Did yes. each of these schools have a recess pilot at it? No. 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 Okay. We had so recess pilots at Concord and at Normandale. That's what I thought. The other four did not. Just wanted to yep. make Thank that you. clear. Absolutely. Thank you. 
And this is only a two-week period that we looked at? It was a two-week period for the purpose of looking at disciplinary referrals specifically related to this evaluation that we did. So um, do we have data prior to doing the pilots? We have data from some sites. Again, the, the, the clarification really was about how to define a discipline referral for the purpose of this gathering of information. And so our six principles came to consensus on what that definition was. And as we move forward, we will be gathering that data we could in the same way. We could recode prior to, we could go back to last That's year, a possibility. And just recode using whatever definition you've determined. That is a possibility. Okay. And then the staffing model, as we look across our six elementary sites, you see that there are a lot of commonalities in the way that they staff, and also some differences to meet the needs of the individual sites. I was just going to ask a question on that one. When we use the term paraprofessionals, um, I'm assuming these are our paraprofessionals who uh, have certain other assignments throughout the day for specific kids or help in the classroom. Um, so I'm assuming they're pulled from that and then added to the playground, is that correct? I think paraprofessionals come from a variety of sources and I don't have specifics at this time and to answer your question with confidence. Okay. okay. So I had the pleasure of facilitating the uh, focus groups with students, and uh, we ran the focus groups over the course of several weeks, and the groups were 10 to 15 students. We did grade three, grade four, and grade five, and they were grade level specific. It was a stratified random sample, and we had um, great responses and high energy from our student participants. And just a couple of highlights here. Um, the findings suggest in, in general that students love recess. It's their, for some of them, it's their favorite part of the day. Um, they do their voice. There's a desire for a longer recess that was across the six sites. Um, more and improved equipment. An ongoing voice in their recess experience. Improved relationship with recess staff and more field day type experiences. We had lots and lots of other great suggestions um, and we have documented all of those to include an ice cream parlor outside and a warming hut for the winter, those kinds of very creative thinking. Site specific, um, when asked the question what the role of the supervisor was, this was an interesting finding. We um, found that at Normandale and at Concord, our students in general could clearly articulate the role of the supervisor to include um, playing with children, teaching them new games, keeping them safe, um, helping with conflict resolution, ensuring all students had the opportunity to play. When that question was posed to the other four sites, our students had a, had a harder time articulating what the role of the playground supervisor was. Um, but across all of the sites, students indicated a strong desire for more relationship, more personal relationship with their supervisors. And there was also um, an indication that, at least for some students, there are some playground limitations, especially for older students at Normandale. They felt the space was not large enough for them to be able to really run and play. So some recommendations here in general. These are recommendations to the sites for the administrators and their teams to consider as they implement next generation recess aligned to vision. So some clear expectations to en ensure an inclusive and respectful uh, experience. We've embedded here the opportunity for students to be engaged in a leadership role through a, perhaps a student recess committee, um, professional development for the recess supervisors, and we heard that from our principals as well. And then maximizing resources and partnerships so that we have an efficient and effective staffing model. For the recess monitors, this really comes from the students. Ensure an inclusive recess experience for all. Facilitate positive relationships. Our students and supervisors to be proactively teaching and modeling conflict resolution skills and to actively engage and play with them. And then just some recommendations around equipment and resources. Our kids said they'd love to have more balls on the playground or just have the balls filled with air 
either would be fine. Um, some schools have a buddy bench. Kids felt very positively about that, and uh, the recommendation is every school would have one. And our kiddos also indicated they'd really like to have water mm -hmm. out at recess. So, and I am happy to take your questions, recognizing that this report has been quite lengthy. Um, I'm happy to, to take some questions. Susan, thanks. This is absolutely really thorough, a lot of good information. Could you describe the buddy bench? A buddy bench is a dedicated space, a bench on the playground, and a student um, may sit on that bench at any time, and if they are feeling that they would like to connect with a game or some other people and aren't feeling that they can do that on their own, they find a spot on the buddy bench and another child knows there's someone who needs someone to play with. So it's kind of a come and sit by me or come and play with me kind of indicator. Okay, very friendly. Kids spoke very positively about it. Um, so you, this, the surveys with the kids were across all six buildings? The focus groups with the students were across all six buildings, students grades three, four, and five. So about 40 to 45 students at each building. And did you get, did you find that although, you know, some of the buildings obviously don't have the pilot in place, that the kids were looking for similar things from recess in terms of particularly, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, relationships with the supervisors or uh, more instructive play, uh, trying to gauge, you know, what, what they were looking for. Yes. So when we ask the question, what else could the recess supervisor do to make recess better? Those are the kinds of responses we heard. I'd like the recess supervisor to know my name, or I would like to be able to know the supervisor's names. I'd like it if they would play with us, or if they would come and help us when we're having a conflict. Um, if they could maybe ref our games, that would be great. Those kinds of comments came back from our students. Interesting, because I would say, uh, you know, just from having two kids go through elementary, um, there is a difference between an active, engaged, supervisor on the playground versus the kid who the supervisors on the playground is just there to say please don't do that please don't do that yes um, rather than engaging with the kids or or, or knowing their names yes. um, you, you do hear that and kids recognize that and mm -hmm. that's exactly they do. what they're looking for they do so so I thank you very much I actually had a couple more questions we had I'm talked, so sorry uh, no no about um, instructional time increasing as part of uh, one of the desired outcomes anyway can you talk to that or is there that was not part of the pilot uh, the, excuse me the study um, in terms of how time would be structured around recess that's a decision I think it actually had to do with the disruptions from free play recess that caused uh, I guess arguments that spilled over into the classroom I see yes so the um, that was not a question that we asked of students, um, and it certainly did not um, bubble to the surface in any conversations we had with our principals. However, it was part of our research earlier in the year around the recess pilot. And the evaluation from teachers indicated that there was less disruption during those transition times at the two schools where we had the recess pilot in place. So, but it was not a question that we asked as part of this study at the end of the year. Okay. So, okay. I mean, is there a bottom line to this? I mean, obviously the, the, the Playworks model that was used at the beginning of the year, and although I know that we've tweaked that to make it the dino, in the dino way of doing it, but I'm just wondering for, for the community, are we recommending that the pilots that we that we had going on at Normandale and Concord will be replicated at the other four elementaries or will we, there be room for the buildings to tailor it to their building or whatever you're recommending? I appreciate the question. The purpose of the study at the end of the year was to gather baseline data and student feedback that can inform the building, the building leadership and their building, building leadership team in terms of how they will create a next generation recess experience that is right for their site. And it's about 
you know, recognizing where the strengths of the program are, where there's some areas for growth, and how to best provide that experience for their students. So a strict recommendation, a strong recommendation in one way or the other is not as the result of this um, evaluation, but it is meant to inform principals as they move forward, forward, and we will continue to collect data as we move forward. Okay. And I did have a meeting today with the elementary principals just on a variety of topics, but the recess was obviously one of them. They used, they took a look at the uh, information shared and the recommendations, and then each site is really taking a look at what does this mean for our school culture, uh, and each site has a different look, be it uh, how they might want to staff it, uh, be it the need for conflict resolution, or be it the need for watering stations. So they're all taking pieces of it and reflecting it back to their school sites. Thank you. Next is leadership update. Uh, this is the end of the year, so there are a lot of reports, and I'm just going to introduce uh, some players who will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, one of the reports is our alt comp report, and I believe Libby and Randy are here to give an update on that, and I'm going to turn it over to them. And then we've got a variety of other, uh, just again, end of the year reports for the board to uh, take a look to, or take a listen to, and uh, respond to with questions. So I'll turn it over to Libby and Randy at this point. Good evening, Chair Wallen Freeman, uh, Superintendent Dressen, our school board and community members. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us some time to talk to you tonight about our Edina Teacher Evaluation and Alt Comp Program. I'm joined here by Libby Sandvik, our Teacher uh, Evaluation Program Facilitator, and Rhonda Geary, our, um, one of our peer coaches that work with teachers on a regular basis. And um, the, the program that we have uh, in place in Edina Public Schools has really been um, a significant factor in continuing to improve teacher quality in our school district. We, are, uh, we have great opportunity to provide feedback on a regular basis with teachers and provides a great growth opportunity for them as they partner with their peer coaches to reflect upon their instruction and to think about new ways that they want to try to make uh, instruction better as they move forward. Uh, this really represents a very successful partnership between our, our teacher bargaining unit, EME, and our school district, and we're excited to both share some results, tell a few stories, and then talk about where this is headed next. So I'm, at this time, I'll turn it over to Libby. Thank you. So this is the second year of teacher evaluation, our eighth year in QCOMP. Um, by statute, we are to present you with an annual QCOMP report. Since our QCOMP program and teacher evaluation are kind of merged into one, it's an update on both programs. Uh, so this year in year two with the teacher eval implementation, we did have some changes and then some continuation of things from last year. So at this time last year, I came to you uh, requesting a suspension of the exceeds expectation rating. We found that to be very successful this year. Teachers were willing to um, try new teaching go and take risks in the classroom because they were comfortable receiving a meets expectations, not trying to put on um, a dog and pony show to try to achieve an exceeds expectations rating. Uh, our probationary teachers worked on a subset of descriptors rather than all 19 descriptors. That subset was dictated by their year of probation. Um, our coaches and administrators continued to meet in quarterly training sessions. Our coaches continued to meet weekly on Monday mornings to go through program implementation elements and also some training. And our teacher evaluation committee continued to meet monthly to discuss program implementation. Our coaches had over 5,400 meetings this year with our non-probationary staff. So there was quite a lot of meeting going on and discussion around quality teaching in Edina. 
Just a reminder of program expectations, all teachers at minimum have three observations. Our non-probationary teachers are on a three-year cycle and our probationary staff are observed by their principals during the year. All teachers do write student learning goals and are engaged in work around the school improvement plan. We have incentives associated with each of the elements of our QCOMP program. Our professional growth plan is based upon successfully meeting expectations in five descriptors during the year. Our student learning goal incentive is based upon the successful implementation of a goal that is crafted by teacher and approved by either principal or coach. And the site goals are awarded based upon student achievement on a standardized assessment. Um, we're still using Talent Ed as our management system for, it's used by teachers, coaches, and administrators. It's a system that we use to complete forms, monitor progress, we can have electronic signatures, it archives documents. Um, we have the ability to do some one-click reporting, one-click analytics, um, and that's very useful to analyze our data. But the best part is that we have local control and I'll be spending time this summer revising all of Talent Ed because of the changes that we've made to the program and we are able to do that in house. Um, here's an example of, of the way a coach or a principal could use Talent Ed to um, gauge progress of their staff. Um, and they would do that for a variety of processes. They could see where their staff are at any point in the process. Um, we can also look at the one-click analytics to see what percentage of our teachers who have completed a form have answered it in a particular way. So this is just a student learning goal progress check as an example. Um, we did do a spring survey in part because I needed some data for the annual report and it provided some feedback to coaches from their staff. Um, you know, I think that our program continues to evolve, teachers continue to find value in it, and that was evidenced in some of these survey comments, such as, as I become more familiar with the process and descriptors over the years, it's affirmed my practices and helped me to grow. I value the time and discussions as well as the guidance of my coach. Thank you for pushing me beyond my comfort level in a kind and safe way. And then this is an incredibly well-organized and well-run evaluation program. And that, I think, is a testament to the work that our coaches are doing with their teachers and the fidelity with which this program is implemented across the district. Um, the Two of the questions that I needed for the annual report um, had teachers answering the following. My participation in the teacher evaluation program has helped me grow as a teacher this year. 86% of teachers strongly agreed or agreed with that statement. And 88% of teachers strongly agreed or agreed with the statement that my participation in teacher evaluation has had a positive effect on student achievement this year. And Rhonda, one of the peer coaches, is here to speak to some of the experiences she's had with teachers. Rhonda coaches um, teachers from early childhood all the way through the high school and our TOSA staff. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to share several different things that came to mind. There's many of them, but I tried to pick just a different assortment. Um, one that I thought would be interesting for you to hear about is a teacher that I work with who is um, works with the pre-K um, students, and she had a student learning goal that she wanted to work on um, S blends with her students, and that that because these were these are young kiddos. Um, decided that if she could get them to use those correctly 50% and with 50% accuracy, she'd be happy by the end of the year. So um, it, because it was a student learning goal and because we were checking in and I was talking with her and it was something that she was always gathering data about, she ended up, um, her goal was to insert it in um, various times during the day whenever she could with the kiddos and um, the result was that a hundred by the end of the year a hundred percent of them could do it with 50% accuracy so that was great 
and she far exceeded the goal because 93% 93, 93 of them could do it with 90% accuracy. So what she really found was, and this is what we spent a lot of time talking about at the end of the year, is that because she was so intentional with it and because she was thinking about all the different ways that she could um, slip it in during the day just naturally in what they were doing like snack time or walking to the bus or walking down the hall or putting on their boots or whatever they were working on it constantly and she said it really showed me that when I do this with intention intentionality and so often that I see these huge gains and so at the end of the year she was already talking about okay so next year on my student learning goal this is what I want to do this is how I'm going to add to this and um, she basically wrote it out and we're ready to go for the fall. Uh, so that was one example. Another one was um, a teacher that I worked with who teaches facts class. And she has um, so many kids come up to her. We were talking about this in the pre-observation meeting, that so many kids come up to her and they say, is this good? And they show her and they want her verbal, yes, you're right, continue, you're good. And so one of the descriptor descriptors is to help students develop self-assessment skills. So we talked in the pre-observation, what, what do you already have in place and what can you really implement to help students be, um, to, to be able to assess it themselves? And so um, she always has a visual of what something should look like at different stages. She has different things for them to watch for. And um, additionally, um, she, she will say, you know, they have the recipe that they can always look back at. So we talked about, let put those things into place and instead of saying, yes, that looks great, you can continue, she, would, she decided she was gonna ask these questions or say, you know, have you, have you checked your recipe? Or did you check the visual? Does yours match that? And so she ended up doing this and then in the, um, in the observation it was apparent that she was doing that. And so we talked about it in the post that she was going to continue doing this and what was really neat is at the end of the year when she did her peer observation in the post that peer did not know that this was something that she was working on she didn't know that this was something she and I had talked about and in the post a meeting where I was present the peer said I love how you have the students always reflect back and ask themselves the questions versus you telling them what you know if it's right or not and so um, she said, you, you, uh, I heard you asking over and over things about, you know, have you checked your recipe? So to me, that was proof that she'd really implemented it and, and had it part of her um, teaching. And then one last one um, that comes to mind is a, um, somebody who's a veteran teacher and um, after the, the, the lesson, in the post, uh, this person mentioned that, I wish you had been at my earlier hour because they were so much more, I think he said something like so much more well behaved. And so I asked the question, um, the, this, the group that I saw, were they engaged? What's the difference between being engaged and being compliant? And then we talked about it and he said, you're right. Every, every question that they were asking, even if some of them were blurting it out, it was all on topic. And so then we talked about, was the other hour engaged? Were they compliant? And so he said at the end, because I usually ask the question, what do you, what's your takeaway from this experience? And at the end he said, I loved how you made me think about compliance versus engagement because you're right. Even those, those kids were more restless, they were completely engaged and they were completely on topic and they were excited about it and that's why they were, they were asking the questions that they were. Going into the 2016-17 school year and beyond, we have a new MOU Memorandum of Understanding and it involves a revised rubric that has greater clarity. We had a large team of teachers and administrators that worked on that. Uh, rubric and the intent of it is to go a little deeper, increase the expectations a little bit more and as we have more and more professional development then that professional development gets incorporated into practice and then the expectations continue to go up about what we see in the classroom and specifically around how we use data and how data is analyzed around assessments, uh, the implementation of culturally responsive and linguistically responsive strategies in the classroom. Those are some of the expectations areas that increase. We also then crosswalked those uh, rubric items with the research on best instructional practices to make sure that what we're asking of our staff is in line with the research on best practices. 
Uh, we have these very fun meetings during the year at 7 a.m. Libby and I always <laughs> love these. And uh, we have our administrators and our peer coaches come together. And some of what we've done in the past is to look at videos and lessons of teachers teaching and then evaluate those lessons. And then we look at how did everybody score that? How did you do it individually? How did you do it with your, compared to your table mates? And then what does the data look like across the room? And the intent of that is to practice inter-rater reliability. Yeah. Because if our rubric can produce inter-rater reliability, then we know our rubric is really being interpreted in a consistent way across mm -hmm. the administrators and across the peer coaches. Yeah, that's great. Sometimes we find that there are places where we need to make adjustments, and we've done that over time. But that's one of the ways that we um, get at doing some of the training so that we provide a, a consistently strong feedback program across the district. And we still have work to do there uh, by by all means, but it is a great opportunity to continue to grow and push the program. Uh, we continue to have this blend and this magic mix of, of coaching and evaluation, and part of the coaching is cognitive coaching. It's getting teachers, both classroom and non-classroom, to self-reflect. And uh, then the, the final part of it is, at, at the end of the day, there is an evaluation. And that evaluation is to determine where are you at on these descriptors? Are you at proficient? Are you developing? Is, was there not enough evidence indicated yet? Um, and then as Libby mentioned, we have a great software system, Talent Ed, which is, really provides this rich database for building a growth mindset in our staff and gives us an opportunity to really pull out the evidence of whether or not these descriptors are being addressed and are being met. And so at this time, we would like to ask if you have any questions. And again, thank you for the time to share this report with you this evening. I wanted to say that I loved hearing the stories. That was great. And can you tell me about a situation where you have a teacher, whether it's just you know an annual review or it's a teacher who's working on tenure, where they're really having a difficult situation and they're struggling to find tools to help them and how you've been able to work with them to help them. Um, I would say the, the first thing that pops into my mind is just with all the push and the work that we've been doing with the culturally responsive, culturally and linguistically responsive strategies. And um, I can speak for myself, but I can also say this is what other coaches are doing too, um, that we, um, there's a teacher at the, the elementary level who developed some, they're basically note cards that have different strategies on them. And the coach who worked with her said, these are so great. They're, they're Shiraki Holly's work, but they're just in a handy format. And we said, can we use those and can we share them? So we all carry them around with us. And so when people are wondering about, you know, how can I do this? Or if we see an area where that maybe could happen, then what we do is we pull those out and we say, take a look at some of these. Do, do some of these look like they might work? Oh yeah, I could try this or, oh, you know, and then they might ask questions about how does that work? Have you seen it happen? And so I would say that because that's such a, a high learning curve for so many, I would say that that's the area that, that jumps out and we just have the resources with us to share with them. So it's nice because we're all sharing it from one another. And then my next question is just overall, do you feel like the majority of our staff feels that this is a cooperative thing, not uh, I'm here to review you and tell you everything that you're doing wrong, but to help you grow in your profession? Okay, I can take it. Um, I would say that um, especially now that we don't have the exceeds expectations i think that has really helped people to feel like they're not supposed to prove something that they're they're really there to learn that it's a growth model and so people are willing to as they were before once they got more used to the program ask questions and say um you know what do you think about this in fact i had now this is just popping into mind i had some um teachers this spring a team who was trying something new and they were very very nervous about it and because it, it, it was new content to them and I won't go into a lot of detail because I want to just m maintain confidentiality but they were um, they shared with me how nervous they were and they did it and a couple of them invited me in and that was their observation so that shows that they're willing to you know go out there and try something and the reason they asked is because they said if you're there 
I've got another set of eyes in the room and you can give me feedback about what happened. So, and, and a, a couple, at least one other one had their peer come in and observe it. So I think that's good, a good example of how mm -hmm. that, that really does happen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think it's exciting to have observation in the classroom and to not have that pressure to say I exceed the standard. I think going towards that cooperative, um, some more questions about what can we do to make it better, what's working for you, what's not. Maybe those are out there, but it's just not the questions we're seeing. Um, the two that we see helped me grow as a teacher and had a positive effect. The way they're worded, it's sort of saying 86% agree it's better than nothing, what we've got, which isn't really probing for where we can improve. So, you know, sort of, uh, I guess sometimes the same thing when we're looking for feedback on these programs that we don't expect it to exceed expectations of the time, but we're looking for constant feedback and improvement and growth as well. And I had another question, but I'm actually- And just to address blank. that this yeah, fall, please. we, uh, in anticipation for crafting the new MOU that will cover 2016 through 2018, we did some focus groups at, um, with both teachers and principal coach group to get some of that information. How can we, we have the opportunity now to make some larger scale changes to the program. What do we need it to look like? Um, and so, you know, at, we gave this survey, you know, the last two weeks of school only had 120 respondents out of our 655 teachers, um, which is actually in alignment with every other survey we've given in the yeah. spring. It's always right around 120 <laughs> people replying. And, you know, usually you get the respondents that really love it or really hate it. Sure, and, you know, one the of the comments mm -hmm. was, I think I put this on every survey. I'll put it here again, you know, <laughs> and it was the same response that I can remember reading from the last few years. And, and their biggest gripe is something that just doesn't work statutorily with the QCOMP <coughs> requirements. And, you know, so part of our programs are playing with that too. Gotcha. What, are the, what box are we in due to state requirements? Yeah. So I can't say yeah. I know what this would do to the data, but if you tied their financial payment to completion of the survey, you'd have more responses. Yes, and, and someone suggested that. <laughs> the uh, confidentiality piece there, yeah. you got to figure out how to do that. Fair enough, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> well, we did it with the seniors. They can't get their diploma without right. filling it out, and it is still anonymous. So Just, you know, a yeah. thumbs up that they've done it. Another question, actually, I went back to the, the story. I really liked it, too, about the engagement versus compliance. But there's a third part, too, about the um, how do you know what they've learned? Because there's material you've covered, and there's material they've learned. And just, and maybe you do this anyway, with emphasizing that what, what formal and informal assessments, both formative and inform, um, summative, did you do during this lesson period? And how are you going to use that to inform tomorrow? Because a lot of teachers, and myself, I'm just a novice, but they, it's, it gets more into did I get through the material today? Did they do the activities that I think will be helpful as opposed to always probing to make sure that you're ready to move on? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about talent ed. Is it cumulative over the years? In other words, here is the profile we're trying to develop over our staff over a set period of time, or is it sort of standalone year to year? So year to year, the documents are archived and teachers have access to in the fall, they'll have access to their past two years worth of rubrics, pre-observation forms, goals, everything that has been submitted in there. Um, one piece that I'm working with Talent Ed on is how to seamlessly transfer data from one year. If I was a year one teacher this year, next year I'll be a year two teacher. How does the data from that rubric this year populate next year's rubric? We tried something new this year and decided it might not be the best approach. So I'm working with Talent Ed next year to do a data export and then a data import so that it can be, for non-probationary teachers, a multi-year, really a three-year um, rubric with that information so that we can, as coaches, talk to them about it, their rubric from a growth standpoint and look at the cumulative data that's yeah. there, yeah. But I'm still, you know, there's things with Talent Ed that I know it should be able to do, but I can't figure out how to make it do that. So that's where I'm working with Talent Ed to say, help me do this, so. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Just like to Thanks. publicly thank Libby and Rhonda for all their work on this program and coaching every day. 
quality of our teachers in the classroom is the biggest school factor that affects the education of our uh, students and they contribute to that daily so I just want to thank you both. I'd ask uh, Val Burke to join me as we uh, give an update on our early education recommendations for our three to five year old program. Um, again, uh, we've been studying our early ed pro program uh, both through our birth through grade five as well as our community education survey. Uh, we've also done some work around special education to do some more study. Uh, but again, always taking a look at best practices and uh, making sure we continue to have this quality program. Uh, as we looked at uh, doing our assessment, we started to uh, assess uh, what some of the needs were. And so we were responding to these needs. This was data that was collected uh, throughout uh, the last couple years, most specifically uh, in January uh, when we did a, a data dive with both our staff and our parent population. Um, the overall recommendation focused again on building successes in our current programming, both the early childhood family ed as well as the early childhood special ed, the school readiness, the pre-K, uh, making sure we had this continuum of support so it's uh, birth through grade five, so we needed to keep that connection with our elementary schools, this continuum of learning so we're meeting the growing demands of our students and, and their parents, and so it, it's to really get them school ready and also have our schools ready for our uh, future kindergartners and then expand our operations, our efforts uh, around uh, quality programming. Uh, we did a lot of our work with our um, birth through 33 month uh, study, and I'll ask Val just to touch base on this, but this was recommendations that the board approved in February, and we're already starting to move on. Yes. Um, yeah, you're right. Good evening, uh, school board members. Uh, with our uh, birth through 33 program, we, in those recommendations, talked about follow-up with our legislators and with the Department of Human Services, which we have done and are having ongoing conversations, looking for opportunities to be able to continue to deliver our um, two-year-old program in a variety of ways, some with a day in the building and a day out of the building. And we look forward to hearing back from um, the department with the overall goal of not being a licensed Department of Human Services facility for that. We've been working with our other providers in the community and we have a meeting scheduled for June 24th where all the other preschool and early education providers will meet with myself and Lisa Hawthorne from Early Childhood Special Education to talk about what are the needs and gap areas because what we heard loud and clear from the conversations was there were gap areas in, in sort of part-time infant and um, early ed care. So those conversations are happening and some of those providers have actually been part of our conversation when we've invited the community and parents in. So they've been very productive. So we're moving on those recommendations. The three to five year old program then uh, really took a look at again where we can go next with our personalized learning experiences, um, really taking a look at how we assess progress and um, some of the tools that we need to use both uh, in the early childhood area but also in the early childhood special area and how we can use that assessment tool um, to help even our kindergartners that use that information and move that in, even into our primary years uh, to help them be uh, more successful in measuring the students' readiness for school, for uh, their next step in their educational experience. Also there's tools within that assessment that help families in, in determining uh, the success rate. Uh, we are continuing to look at the latest research and looking at different conferences, different programs that are out there that are uh, highly recognized. Uh, and then again taking a look at how we can enrich the family experience. Uh, as our families become, uh, have greater needs and uh, more diverse needs, how do we respond to that? Uh, maybe it isn't just that one size fits all, not only for our students, but for our parent population. Mm -hmm. And then also taking a look at the partnership piece that, that we can uh, shape between uh, early childhood family education and early childhood special education, which really are two different contracts, and that's a challenge not here in Edina, not here in just the state, but uh, throughout the United States, of how you blend uh, the staffing to maximize those resources while still re respecting the differences that need to occur in the work agreement. But those are the major areas of focus. Um, and uh, I don't know, Val, if you want to add things to that, uh, the board does have the specifics tied out in a recommendation which identifies all the specific uh, actions that we're going to be taking over the next couple of years uh, to implement uh, these three to five-year-old strategies. But Val, just some summary comments around that? 
One thing that I was really impressed with, with both uh, meetings in January and then we had two uh, parent community meetings just last week, is the engagement of the participants and just the tenor of the group who were, who were really very excited and engaged in how we're going to be moving this forward, um, wanted to be a part of that um, input session, loved the fact that we were going to be aligning with the birth through grade five so that the information that, again, we gather through our assessments in early ed would line up and be informational for our kindergarten teachers so that kids would come in sort of with their own little portfolio. And um, lots, of, lots of engaged questions, but the cooperation and collaboration with that group was, was uh, really, really great to see. And the timing of this is important because we do want to start moving on even looking at how we can uh, tie the two uh, programs together more tightly, even at a staffing level. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are asking for action tonight on this. Um, it does align well with, in the birth through five with the community ed survey, uh, our community ed strategic plan, as well as the zero to 33. So it's a nice continuity piece, and uh, we're very excited how this is going to roll over the next two years. I think Val and Jeff Jorgensen, uh, Lisa Hawthorne, a variety of people have been very instrumental in helping move this initiative forward, and we commend them for this work. But we'll take questions if there are any. Well, I just wanted to tell you that I've heard some great feedback from the, the pre-K families that they've been feeling a great collaboration. I know we had a little hiccup in the fall with some needs to have to change some of our programming, but I've heard great feedback that, that you know, they've been working with you, in particular Val, and through the PTO. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Um, also, can you give me some thoughts or examples around, you know, for those of us who are familiar with the current programming and the classes, and then of course the parenting classes, how, what types of things do you see that we need to adapt to help us better serve our, our changing community? Particularly say, give me an example in parenting and in the early, or the kid side. So some things that we are doing right now will build on. <laughs> We've had our targeted services coordinator, Mary Stryer, working with our liaisons, our cultural liaisons. And so they have met, we, we facilitated a meeting together so that the Spanish and Somali liaison could help us reach families that we hadn't uh, particularly reached. And they've had also ongoing conversations about um, we had in the past, but bringing programming to different areas of the community. Um, gotten some great feedback and ideas on even like a, a, a literacy bus going to different places to engage. We had a really wonderful participant in our small group who talked to us really about, you know, uh, there, and, and this isn't necessarily new information, but it's something new learning that we really need to do is that many communities need face-to-face -face contact, you know, contact as opposed to just that written, like, would you come? And so that invitation, that sitting down looking, um, I think will become par part of our, our uh, portfolio of opportunities for families. Is I that, think, and yeah. I think on the uh, uh, student programming side, looking at bringing uh, uh, English language learner programs yeah. to our preschool. Mm -hmm. So that there's a readiness, you know, and, and the younger we can capture uh, that attention and that mm -hmm. interest, the more quickly they can master that second language. And so helping them grow that. And so we're looking at some program options around that would be another example. Uh, I think, again, our facilities, as those evolve, uh, we're gonna, those are going to create a lot of opportunities for us as well as when we have that one early childhood center approach. Okay, and then I just had one other question as I was reading through the, the actual document that's attached in the action portion. Um, tell me about streamlining access to registration. Are we still, I mean, I remember the old days of sitting out in the cold all night waiting to register, and we've come a long way since then. So what types of things do we still need to improve to make it a better experience for our families? We want to make it less siloed for our early childhood special education and early early family ed programs. So we're creating a, sort of a one-stop shop. I know that's a cliche, but really integrating our operations staff so that families can come in and get every single question answered from from one spot. Okay. So that's really Instead one of, of the ways we're talking about streamlining. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I had a question about goal three. One of the I can see upcoming. I'm losing my spot here. One of the upcoming lines for 2017-2018 was all day pre-K mm -hmm. as a pilot. And I'm just curious to know what some of the goal outcomes are, if you're seeing that you know, we're still having trouble getting students kindergarten ready or if we're trying to 
consider moving kindergarten material down an age group or what what other outcomes are the goals there? So when we started doing our research, um, actually throughout mm -hmm. the last couple of years, best practices will tell us for some yeah. students who in our school readiness programs, which has very defined um, uh, ways of identifying students for school readiness, that more time in the pre-K classroom is very appropriate for them in order to be school ready or to help us get ready for them be ready for school. Um, also, we have a parent demand out there that we have noticed during the last two years where two uh, working family, two parent working families are asking us to deliver a program that is more comprehensive and all day. Can you say more about the selection criteria? So this wouldn't be something at this point that parents would just be able to opt into, but they would actually have to, during a screening process, have somebody agree that your child is one of the certain percentage that meets the criteria for this is that right it's a both and because we are a, um, a fee-based program it's a both and oh, sure. we have our but target yeah I guess what I mean is it's not as easy to just say I want it so here's the check you'd have to be screened into it you'd have because you were saying some students some student the students that are school ready uh, our school readiness students which is a defined legislative program and it has a set of criteria in terms of what what that I, um, you know, it has to do with poverty, it has to do with access, um, that those students would be invited in or encouraged into the process. We can't really make anybody, um, but those would be in, invited students. I'm, am I answering? I think so, and just, yeah. I don't want to repeat it, but just, uh, so it's, if it's targeted for students who yes. aren't currently getting school ready with the services provided, it, then it's not something that's open to the whole community it's not something where parents can just opt in if they're willing to write the check so it's not both and in that sense it's not open to all pre-k it would be open to all pre-k pre okay so then mm -hmm. it's not really well we what we do now currently is we have we reserve spaces yeah. for a variety of students so all of our programs are mixed we reserve spaces for uh percentage for from early childhood special ed right. we have we reserve spaces for some of our school ready students and then we have open access so that it's a blended classroom it's not you know there's no one classroom right. it's just all targeted students okay does that make sense well it does it just starts at that point to replicate other preschools in the area and so i guess some of the demand from parents must be for something that they see as more affordable or access is that what you're hearing i think there's no other place that provides the, and, and Jeff Jorgensen could say it better than I, just the cloud of services, including um, speech services, OT, PT, that a school district, a public education system can provide right on site. So it's really, um, there, there are families that love that comprehensiveness. Sure. And on All the right. flip side of that, I would say that we're the only preschool program that offers the parenting component. That yes. and paired together is, is, in my personal opinion, the best preschool program that there is to have those two components combined. But we also have just the pre-K and all those combined services. But we are one of many providers, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and really it's really parental choice, but we want to have a, a, a variety of options, a part-time, a full-time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Val. I'm going to call in Margo Bach to uh, give an overview of the preliminary budget. This, again, is another action item that uh, is taking place later in the evening, but we just thought we'd wrap all of our reports together at one time. Good evening, Dr. Dressen and um, Mr. Chair and school board. It's that time for the preliminary budget, and we have, um, this is kind of a culmination of the last six months of work, so I want to thank you as a school board, the finance committee, uh, certainly our budget advisory task force um, that met in February weekly for about three or four weeks and did um, uh, awesome work and participation with us. And certainly um, the business office staff, it wouldn't come together with without them and uh, Pauline Fofana our controller is here t tonight uh, to celebrate the success that is done <laughs> as well as I and um, 
also uh, certainly the site staff. It takes everybody, whether you uh, supervise or monitor a $100 budget or the overall budget as you do as a school board. So I appreciate that. Um, I'll try to go through here uh, relatively quickly, but just the major assumptions. We did discuss this at the last finance committee meeting. Um, we, uh, the legislature did increase the, our revenue by 2% for the 16-17 year. Um, still projecting pretty stable uh, kindergarten enrollment and overall average daily membership. Expenditures do include the uh, board approved budget plan from April and in addition to that, the enhancements uh, that the board approved in May uh, and a variety of other, other things that we've already gone over throughout this budget process, so I won't reiterate all those. Um, a couple key points before I get into the charts and graphs. Um, that w have changed since the last time we had a conversation. One uh, is more significant information uh, in relationship to the new special education formula. So we have incorporated those changes uh, in the, not only in the revenue, but also on the expenditure side of things. We um, have spent some time, uh, Jeff Jorgensen and myself, um, and the business office teams and the special ed teams working together on coding, um, and also brought in um, a, the retired special ed guru from MDE, recently retired, uh, to help guide us in how this new formula is going to work. 1516 is key for this formula. It sets the stage for the future of the formulas. In the long run, I think it's, it's, it's a good change, um, but we need to be very diligent and mindful of the impact and not just do everything the way we have always done it. We want to make sure we're doing it to maximize um, our revenues in terms of um, both state and federal for special education services. Uh, it's not a year you want to miss reporting something or something like that. So um, you will note, as uh, if you're looking in the details, which we won't go through tonight, um, you, you will see an increase in state aid and it looks like federal aid has gone down. That's just kind of the combination of how we're gonna make both of these work. Um, and again, you might see in some detailed expenditure areas where it looks like some of the state special ed is higher, but correspondingly, federal expense is a little bit lower. So note, note that change and where it, I'm being very cautious in terms of the projections. Um, it will be key to get through uh, 1516 audit and reconciling of our special ed data. And um, I'll update you uh, more in the fall in that regard, because we'll have one year of history then uh, with this new formula and update projections accordingly. So a lot of unknown yet, but we know more than we did six months ago and a year ago on this whole new formula. So, and feel like we had great resources helping us um, um, with these projections, both uh, retired and current MDE staff. So the other key change is in the um, change July 1 of this coming year in the long-term facilities maintenance project funding, uh, formally termed alternative facilities. The new coding requirements for this alternative facilities has always been coded under construction or fund six. The new coding requirements for this effective July 1 are that any projects under $2 million are required to be reported in the general fund along with the revenue. And then any projects over $2 million are to be under construction. Uh, I'm not sure the exact philosophy, but my understanding is that Anything under two million is not substantially commit, uh, improving the value of the overall building and is typically funded on a pay-as-you-go basis through the annual levy process versus issuing bonds. And I think that's uh, the state and the committees that uh, recommended this um, kind of came up with that benchmark. So what you will see in the documents when you compare, uh, for example, 1516 to 1617, you will notice that on the revenue and the expense side in the general fund, and in, it's a little harder to see in construction because we got the bond tying in there, but, but specifically the general fund, you'll see uh, revenue has increased and so has expenditures because of that coding change. Um, just note that um, 
if that coding change had not taken place and it was all still in instruction, that revenue would have increased 2.1% and expenditures 0.9%. So that gives you a little bit of a framework of um, when you're comparing in the individual statements what that looks like. All in all, the report is a good report. Uh, we are close to projections and we did perform better um, just a little bit, uh, not a lot, but just a little bit in terms of the enrollment projections. And then also this special ed funding change did provide uh, an increase in revenue from projections uh, when I provided the long range plan to you in January. Again, I'm trying to be very cautious on that, uh, the additional revenue associated with the new special ed formula. At the same time, I do want to acknowledge, I do think there is going to be an increase in revenue in that area. And, and so there, um, that has had a positive impact. Uh, the remainder of, um, so that's the primary assumptions and changes. Um, the actual budget document itself that is included in your board materials includes an executive summary, a nice narrative format with some graphs and charts to just give you an overview of what has occurred and what has changed from the previous year, organizational section. And then the financial section has um, more detail in terms of the impact on the fund balances and then also uh, five years or four years of previous history plus the 16, 17 year in the various funds so you can see some trends, things that might, uh, might be happening and then informational section provides much more detail. From the fund balance um, perspective, we really focus on page 14, pages 14 and 15. Again, uh, very close uh, to projections, uh, slightly above it because of the increase um, in projected special ed aid. So on the charts, you can even see uh, the change in both the coding change uh, and how that impacts an increase in revenue. So you see in the general fund on the re revenue side an increase uh, for 16, 17. Uh, correspondingly, you also see on the building side if, if we hadn't received the bond dollars, you would probably see the uh, revenues go down. Um, but we have uh, bond dollars coming in and um, long-term facility maintenance bond funds that will come in in this coming year. So you see both revenues go up in this case. Um, and again, the general fund expenditures are going, going up because of the recoding for the long-term facility maintenance. Uh, and you see as we are spending down our construction funds, you can see that um, that's going to throw the building fund ch chart off quite a bit. General fund revenue history and our expenditure history. Where do we receive our dollars? The majority, almost 70% comes from the state in the general fund. Uh, our expenditures, um, we are a service industry and we do spend over 80% of our budget on either direct student support or uh, instructional support type <laughs> services and staff to provide those services to students. I will, um, let, let you know if you didn't notice already that there's two slides in a row that look exactly the same. <laughs> I noticed that just before the board meeting. So the second one, and I've given it, uh, Sarah will update your materials for you. The second one is actually to be more specific and include, separate the salaries um, into licensed staff, uh, administration, support staff, that kind of thing. So again, uh, we are the majority of our service is direct instruction to students. So in the licensed instructor area and QCOMP, which you just heard about, that's um, about 74% of the budget with the remaining being in types, uh, support staff, uh, administration, and other types of positions. And then our expenditures by program, uh, again, over 70% of our program area is either direct instruction or support services to students and as part of the budget process I always have to update the fund balance chart I will qualify this um, in that um, it is up to date reflecting the 1617 um, preliminary budget here I'm presenting to you tonight uh, I have not updated any assumptions uh, from January for 1718 but it does correspond any impact in 1617 does either positive or negatively impact going forward. Uh, we'll continue and need to monitor um, moving into the fall um, 
how the audit results come in, monitor the special ed funding situation, fall enrollment, um, new hire staff, that kind of thing when we update uh, the final budget in the fall. And then also the next gen planning and programming and implementation, getting more data on that to update the long range plan in a multi-year, not just 17, 18, but um, 18, 19 and beyond too. But the good news is between the work of um, uh, of the Budget Advisory Task Force, their recommendations, you as a board, Finance Committee, um, we did make adjustments in the budget and you can see that that has had a positive impact on the trajectory in addition to uh, the special ed revenue coming in a little bit better. So with that, I would answer any questions that you have. For the, just looking ahead, Margo, for the 17, 18 school year for special ed, do we expect it to hold constant or do we expect to see a continued uh, growth? I would, I would not expect it to grow as in this year in the transition. Um, there is an inflationary factor in that new, the, the new formula, so there would be some small growth, but I would guess it wouldn't, it, you know, it might be 1 or 2% or something so, so like that. So we've captured the benefits yeah, there. I, I believe so. Thank you. I just want to thank you and your team for all their work and, and to the community for helping us figure out, you know, how to tighten our budget and make it work. So thank you. Thank you. So if you take out the change that the legislature did on the construction, how that's impacted, where are we at in the budget in terms of uh, expenditures higher than revenue? Uh, so if we take a look at that, we are uh, just under a million dollars higher. And that is because um, uh, we were intentionally spending down some fund balance. If you recall, we came in better as of June 30th, 2015. Uh, part of our budget plan was to use a little bit of the fund balance um, as, as we met in January and worked with the Budget Advisory Task Force. So, and some of that, when I say that, also would be in the, um, that's not just only the unassigned general fund balance when I refer to that just under a million dollars. That is some of the reserved account balances. So for example, if capital, if we're spending down. So it's a combination of all the areas of the general fund that com comes up with that dollar amount. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? I guess you're done. Thank you, Margo. Thank you. Next is construction. And there is action on uh, the bu budget later in the evening on the construction side. Uh, again, uh, we're working on this blend of uh, making sure we hit the scope that we'd committed to uh, with a schedule that we can live with and staying within the funds we have available. We continue to work hard on that. Uh, this is a slide we've seen before, but we are busy with the high school off and running. Um, our countryside and Concord editions, these are bids that we're going to be sending out and we're asking the board to uh, move on uh, approving that tonight. Uh, we're again looking at the construction of the transportation building, um, lots happening. Uh, then in the spring of 2017, uh, we'll begin the Cornelia construction, looking at again all the other sites that uh, you can just uh, graze down. We know that the summer of 2017 is going to be a very active time in the school district. Uh, and uh, we recognize that uh, as we move forward, this will continue to evolve and we'll be completing all of our work uh, in the summer of 2018. This is a variety of not only the construction project, but a lot of our alt facility projects, again, which is helping with the maintenance of our facilities. Uh, at the high school, we're moving forward on additions. The uh, new commons areas have begun work and uh, we're very active on that. The field work, the high school is closed for the summer and they've moved their offices and all the uh, necessary programming uh, over to Valley View. It's been a smooth uh, 
a smooth shift uh, Valley View. We are looking at a major roof repair. Uh, this is coming out of deferred maintenance. This is something we've been monitoring, and uh, this, the winter was not good to our Valley View, roof, Valley View roof, and so we are looking at a major repair on that. But again, that's out of a different fund, but it's still a major construction project for us. The East Campus, working on our turf fields, as well as doing some parking lot resurfacing and uh, roof repair at the uh, here at the community center. And then we're continuing to move forward with our transportation uh, facilities both uh, on the new land that we now own with the plans on that as well as uh, taking a look at the sale of the current property. Uh, elementary, we're growing our security plans. Uh, we met with the elementary principals today. Uh, as a district, we uh, had a tabletop experiences at, the, at an administrative level uh, by with the help of the Edina Police Department and went through a, a variety of security situations and see how uh, administrators would respond so we'd be at that best practice. We're also taking a look at the elementary uh, schools, uh, doing an upgrade on their facility, uh, on their security at the entrance level. So we're doing a single, a controlled single entrance, uh, even though we aren't able to make the improvements that we had hoped for this summer uh, with some of our school sites and creating a, creating a greater control. So there's going to be a single entrance uh, that is used that will direct uh, all of the uh, visitors and guests uh, right to the office once the school day starts. Uh, we're also taking a look at uh, piloting uh, a buzzer system at uh, Countryside. Again, we're just uh, continuing to make improvements to make sure all visitors are checking in at all of our school sites and then doing some more controlled work at our uh, entrance, especially during the school day. Uh, we continue to assess that, and so then in October, November, we'll get an update of how successful those improvements have been, and then we'll continue to work with that. We want to do this in partnership with our community, so we'll be getting input from uh, staff as well as parents on the success of this as we continue to grow it until we can get uh, some of our security plans formally in place through the construction process. Um, well, again, we mentioned the rebidding uh, at Concord and Countryside. Um, I will call on uh, Susan and Vaughn to kind of help me wor walk my way through some of this work uh, at the elementary, um, taking a look at some of the changes that are being proposed. So Vaughn, maybe you want to pop in here, and Susan. You got it? Okay, Vaughn. Vaughn Dirks from Lowell Architect, a regular visitor here. Regular visitor. Um, so it, this is actually very exciting in the context of many of the things that Susan talked about earlier and, and how we look at facilities and reevaluating what the design work was. Uh, a lot of what we saw earlier in the evening talked about how students were using spaces, ways that are not traditional to typical classrooms, and that's most of what the referenda talked about in terms of how you were looking at your next generation spaces. So as we went back and took a look at all the plans we did for the elementaries, what we were really trying to do was master plan uh, the entire building as we think about it, not just create some space, but think about how the buildings were used in general. As we looked at where we may be beyond that scope, we looked at what was not in the referenda specifically, and we found that we were making major alterations to both art and music spaces in the building when that wasn't something that we had talked about. And so we started with the context of how do we look at each of the buildings and take those two components out and leave the spaces where they are in those buildings, and how does that impact the plans? And what we found was it's still aligned with the goals of the planning groups, the mission of what the district's next generation plan was, and we found very minimal impact in terms of how the building buildings laid out and we're able to achieve the same type of work. So our referenda scope includes those security improvements, the extended learning environments, improvements to all the special education spaces, really reinventing media centers district-wide, uh, and equity between specialist spaces. So we'll quickly run through uh, what changed in the plans. We've had a chance to meet with each of the core planning teams to make sure it's still aligned with their vision and we're quite uh, happy with the results of those meetings and I think they were happy to see that the plans they came up with remained intact. This is our original design for Concord Elementary. And I'll point out most of the work we're talking about is in the lower level uh, where we had moved some of our special education spaces around, have moved art to a new location in the building to try and uh, get a few more windows into the space. Uh, what we ended up with was all of our cluster arrangements for the uh, classroom spaces remained as they were, but our art room remained in the existing location, our GT room remained in that existing location. We're still making special education improvements to uh, the center part to the uh, building, uh, but we were able to make minimal changes to how this building laid out. So we're still achieving that uh, five classroom cluster organization within the building itself. I'm, I know I'm kind of going through this fairly quickly, but I'll answer questions as we get towards the end. 
Uh, countryside, I think, uh, was best described as uh, currently in this location is the office for the building, and we were going to move uh, the office towards the front door. Uh, art is in the upper level for the building, adjacent to music, and we were going to relocate music to this area. Uh, in the design process, they wanted to know, could we put the two music rooms adjacent to each other and locate art in this location? Unfortunately, that required us to renovate three spaces instead of one. And so in our final design, we went back to the original plan of a uh, band room uh, in this location and art and music adjacent to each other. In talking through the programming aspects, they said, you know what, that's something that we can work with. Uh, we've got the music space that we need. We have the art storage space we need. The rest of the building, all the classroom design, the office location remained exactly as the planning groups had worked through. Highlands apparently uh, was blank initially. I'm not sure what happened to the picture here. Uh, well, uh, I will, uh, I'll just move forward. Uh, we had looked at locating kindergarten in the L around this corner, uh, which did displace the art room. Uh, in going back and looking through the building, we said, what if we leave art in this corner and create our four kindergarten rooms adjacent from each other, where we had had classroom space before, reorganized some of our classroom organization, moved our GT classroom towards the end, media center space, all of our CP space for the building remained uh, as originally designed and working with the groups. Uh, again, they found this was something that they really could identify with and felt that it met the needs of the plan so oh, yes I can wait. just on the, on both the plans the new layout of the classrooms are in a our work with what they what we want to do in terms of personalized learning and access to those flexible spaces for all grade levels absolutely and you'll find that the quantity of those extended learning environments the location of them the disbursement through the building remained as designed so that uh, it gave you the flexibility in the future if you remember originally we had labeled each of these classrooms with grade organizations so first grade second grade yeah, and yeah. we took that yeah. off to show the flexibility but as the core planning teams thought through through it, they were still thinking, what does that look like first year? And mm -hmm. um, will it work for the future? And so we still have all of those same uh, intentions with the plan and that flexibility built into it. For Highlands, one of the things that was very important to them was that the classrooms could operate in pairs. And so we still have the pair mm -hmm. uh, organization to that. At Cornelia, uh, a similar floor plan layout to the building. This one, we had a, a few major changes. We had looked at putting additions on both ends of the building as well as an addition uh, out to uh, the side of the building here, which uh, caused a little bit of inefficiency in how we looked at things. Uh, we had also moved some of our art and music rooms around in this location. Uh, the revised plan leaves art and music where they were and shifts our additions from the end of the building into one common addition off the side of the building, so we gained some construction efficiency. We also found that we were able to uh, create some larger extended learning environments in that organization, reorganize a little bit of how we were uh, uh, working with classrooms on this side of the building to leave more of our classrooms intact and reduce the amount of renovation space we had in the building, but overall, uh, our our plan organization remained the same. This one required a couple of meetings with the core planning team. It was probably the most extensive in terms of rework, but in the end, uh, they felt that this plan actually achieved more of their goals than where we had started with the bid documents. So I think that was a, a victory as well. Creek Valley had the least amount of change in terms of what we were doing. Uh, we had simply looked at moving art and music from this location in the building to move the two music rooms adjacent to each other. And going back, music remained in this configuration with art uh, to the side. Uh, very few changes in terms of the overall uh, function to this plan. Normandale again, for whatever reason the picture's not showing up, uh, but it involved how we relocated art and music. Uh, instead of our uh, moving music adjacent to each other, we're going to look at some more sound attenuation for the music space in this location to make it functionally work uh, for the building a little bit better, and the remainder of the plan remained intact as it went through. And so the goal here was really to try and work with that criteria we established with the planning groups, think about what their overall goals were, and think about how to maintain the flexibility for the future of the buildings. And in each one of these cases, I think we found that that was achievable. Uh, bringing the core planning teams back together as a whole, so all six core planning teams met with us for the first meeting, helped them to see uh, the commonality between their plans and, and see that there's a, a, a level of um, standard across the district so that each of the buildings are achieving similar goals I think was also helpful in terms of the redesign and so it was a, it was a valuable process to go back through. Any other questions? So every building in terms of their CPT 
left feeling good with the new changes and understanding why we made the changes and it sounds like even in some cases they were maybe better than before. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, the uh, Corneli plan required us to meet with them a couple of times outside of that group, but for the most part our, of our six teams, the five other groups, uh, after our initial meeting with all of them together and they saw the changes, they said, that's what we're going to do? Fantastic. That looks great. So um, I think that the change impact to them once they saw that their criteria actually helped guide the plans uh, was a valuable process and they understood why we did it so that you could go back in and redesign and still adhere to those rules that they set up for us. Okay. And Cornelia is happy. Cornelia is happy. Okay. <laughs> and likewise, everything we said the referendum would bring about is still in the plan. Absolutely. Intact. Thank you, Vaughn. Yeah, thanks for all your work. And Susan, I know going back and redoing all this, so thank you. Just a few updates on uh, summer happenings. Uh, the new reading series uh, is underway as far as being implemented. We've had training with our administrative staff and gearing up for our uh, teaching staff. Uh, this is a phased in process because it's really a new approach to reading, uh, a best practice approach and much more uh, inclusive and uh, going to again get in performance of our students and we're excited about the training available. This will be a, a major priority uh, for our teaching staff uh, throughout uh, the next couple of years as they uh, gain their expertise in the delivery of this instructional model. Um, again, uh, advancing some of that leadership model, we're going to be hiring two uh, teachers in special assignment to support some of the work that we're wanting to do at our elementary level, secondary level, working hard in their master schedules. We'll have some more discussion with that uh, this summer with the boards. We continue to grow that and also starting to plan out how they're going to grow their courses and curriculum alignment uh, for the fall of 2017 and uh, some uh, discussions occurring actually between the two core teams both at the middle school and the high school coming together so that they have a good alignment as they do their planning. At the district level we're going to be going out serving our community soon uh, around start and end time plans. I mentioned the security training that we recently went through with the uh, police department uh, doing some more uh, survey data reviews. Uh, we did a lot of survey data in the spring and so uh, thanks to the research and um, evaluation department for their uh, data gathering that'll all be part of the school improvement process so we put all that information back into play as we continue to look at goals of how we can get better uh, not only on the academic side but also on that partnership side um, and then tomorrow's a big day in the district as uh, it's our data day where we bring in all our leadership teams from the various schools to start uh, identifying the key goals uh, based on the data findings that we have thus far and how we can make sure uh, we're getting the best out of our school sites uh, in the area of how they can set goals that will really help uh, get our students to perform at that next level. Uh, leadership training is a constant. We have a lot of exciting things going on. Last week we had a couple days of leadership training uh, for administrators, but throughout the summer months, including the Dino Learning Institute in August, lots going on as far as training. And uh, that would uh, be a quick summary of uh, things happening in the district uh, as we close out the 2015-16 school year. Uh, take any questions at this time? Can you just share a little bit about the um the new secured entrances you said that although we won't be you know actually right. making the we're have a more controlled entrance so what yeah we know explain is, what that's going to look what we like. know is that at um southview a very successful tool has simply been a, a roping mm -hmm. process uh, directing yep. students or uh, visitors uh, from that main door to the main office so that they can't pass without <coughs> obviously seeing that we're going to monitor if that's a successful approach or not uh, if it isn't, then we'll go to another approach. Uh, we are going to try a buzzer system where it's an outdoor buzz that you have to buzz to get your, uh, to be allowed into the building and we're going to pilot that to see if that's successful. Okay. We're going to listen very carefully to um, how this is um, as far as on the security side but also on the partnership side with families and visitors to say, is this working? So um, each site is assessing that. Uh, they've come up with a process for doing that. Uh, again, we're also looking at just that number of doors open prior to the start of the school day and trying to restrict that and make that uh, sensible as well because just all of our schools were designed at a very different time. So there are more doorways than we really want at point in places. And given how the buildings flow, we want to make sure that works as well. So the elementary principals have been working on that. Uh, again, today was one of the meetings that we did a lot of work on that. Uh, secondary principals have done a lot of work last year, and they're pretty much staying with those practices as they go forward. Uh, I will also uh, go on to say at security level, we're working with our construction management firm. So we're building an additional security plan as our contractors are around 
to make sure we have a strong, uh, not only safety situation, but a secure situation once the school year starts. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, next is board committee appointments. For some reason, you're listed as, as the presenter. Well, I don't think there's any, uh, this is again, the board takes a look uh, at the six month point of uh, do we want to change our committee assignments uh, or any of the liaison's positions. Um, and at this point, the administration is not recommending any changes for that uh, July through uh, December. I think the committee process is working, but if you do have feedback prior to July, I would encourage you to contact the board chair who will then make those uh, suggestions and the board will formally vote on this at the July board meeting. So typically we do change liaisons or at least consider it June 30th. And I know that there's been one request uh, from Sarah to uh, pick up Highlands. And so that would require the Highlands rep to change. But let me know what and, everybody's and preference is. And I thought it'd be a good time to maybe roll off Cornelius since I've been on that for four and a half years. Okay. Just send me your comments and questions and desires. All right. Next is policy review. Regina, you typically walk us through that. I will walk through policy for or, discussion. You could run through it. Pardon? <laughs> I could run through it. <laughs> I could run through it. Okay. Well, I'm going to group some because I think that it, they fall into just a couple of categories. We, we have a lot of 400 series policies that are up for their standard review. The majority of them just have minor wording edits. There are four that have more extensive edits uh, than before 10 with family and medical leaves, 413 with harassment and violence, 414 mandated reporting of child neglect, and 415 mandated reporting of maltreatment of vulnerable adults. Each of those have more extensive edits to comply with updates to state and federal statute. So uh, I want to thank Stacy Geyer for her work to keep us in compliance. And as always, thanking Sarah Shandall for managing all of the edits in the organization. For 608, the instructional services, there's minor wording edits. And 813, the aquatics policy is brand new. So the policy committee has had an opportunity to talk through this several times as we shape it to make sure that all of our aquatics activities, whether it's classes or athletic events or training, have the best <coughs> kinds of safety that we can provide in terms of lifeguard oversight. So if there are any questions that anyone would like us to take back to the policy committee for our next discussion, I'm happy to take the notes. That's great. You covered it really well. <laughs> Wait, thank you. Excellent, right. thank you. So moving on to action items. The first action item is middle school schematic design proposal. Can I get a motion to approve the middle school schematic design proposal? Second. Uh, do we have a presentation on this? Vaughn? So as is noted in your packet, uh, you will see that there is um, the middle school, if you recall, we had we were moving along with our middle school design process just as we did with all of our other sites. And we gave you an update in December that we were pretty far along on, I would say that about a 75 to 80 percent completed. And there was a pause that we took for several <coughs> months while the middle school design team in terms of program finished their work because there were some questions about how many um, teams per section or per grade. And so we just wanted to, um, since the, some of those key decisions were advanced in the spring, we reconvened the middle school teams in May. And so Vaughn can kind of walk through where we landed with it, but it's pretty similar to what we showed you in December, but we are look, uh, looking for advancement of the schematic design to help us move along in the design process. So similar to the process that we've gone through with the other buildings, we started by bringing both of the middle school groups together to talk about commonalities between the buildings, look at um, shared values and commitments. Uh, I won't go through each of the steps in here, but it provided the groundwork for us uh, in terms of looking at uh, not only the quality of the space, but also some of the basic organizational components to that as we talked about uh, the commitments and what we're trying to achieve uh, via the referenda uh, scope and, and um, goals. Uh, we talked about spaces like extended learning environments. And again, these are things that were common to both buildings that we had the groups talk about together. Uh, 
went on to discuss media commons and uh, frame that around some of the work that our special media uh, task force worked on. Uh, some more criteria around that. Uh, talked about special services and what uh, needed to be in place at both buildings. Both of them have uh, center-based functions and components, and so we spent a lot of time talking about the students and uh, how we would serve those needs. Talked about safety and security, especially important as we looked at Southview and talked about the location of the office facility. Uh, looked at how furniture uh, would integrate with the spaces within the building. Uh, and then we got into working with each of the different buildings because obviously they have very different floor plans, a two-story building versus a three-story building, um, how they're organized, uh, some similarities but a lot of differences. And so we talked about how each one of those would individually have their own criteria, both at Southview and Valley View. Our referenda scope uh, became sort of our um, touch point as we started things with the group and looking at what was included uh, but not as a given in terms of how things would land. Uh, looked at the site and looked at the existing buildings as we walk through things with them. And I'm skipping through this to get to sort of the meat of the design here. So in Southview, what we ended up with uh, was uh, a plan where they could, again, organize the building uh, by grades. It doesn't mean that's how it would have to work in the future, but in terms of talking about things uh, from a current design, uh, this would be our existing middle level to the building. So currently, our office is in this location. And the office will be moving out of this uh, part of the building. So eighth grade or two uh, cluster organizations would occupy uh, this portion of the building. Our media center, like the high school and the elementaries, uh, moves towards more of a learning commons where we open up a portion of the building. If you're familiar with the building, this is where the coffee area is currently. Uh, our art ended up with extended learning environments that support um, some of the adjacent classroom spaces. Once we move to the middle school, like the high school, we have a lot more specialist spaces in the building, and so these extended learning environments were important as breakout for all the different organizations. Uh, we were able to maintain the world language component, and this was a result of taking a pause in the process and realizing that at eighth grade and seventh grade, we were likely only going to be using two of the cluster organizations versus three. Uh, and so that gave us an ability to think about how we organize the specialists a little bit differently. Our fax remains in this portion of the building, uh, and most of the, um, uh, the left half of the diagram here remains as is. We've got a little bit of different organization for some of the classroom spaces, but uh, we're able to maintain most of the work that was done in 2004 with very little change to that portion. Uh, on the lowest level of the building, our office uh, ends up moving down to the lower parking lot. So this is a significant change, which means that our bus entry would be what is now the current parent drop-off. Our parents will now come in off of the parking lot down below, much more intuitive in terms of where you look for the front door to the building. It's where the parking lot actually is. Um, our cafeteria space remains in this location, but our seventh grade uh, organization is near that office area with a large extended learning environment adjacent to the office. One of the things we talked about was space after school for students and how they would use uh, the areas. Uh, we're able to think about project lead the way and project-based learning uh, on this side of the building. And sixth grade with the three clusters organized around the entire top floor to the building. Uh, so we're working a lot with some of the additions that we did in 2011 and 2012 and renovations to the building uh, and providing a reorganization that um, would provide the, um, the flexibility to the plan that they wanted from a planning standpoint. Valley View had their own criteria as they took a look at the building. Again, starting with the referenda diagram and working through things with the building, thinking about it in context of not only the site, but how Valley View is actually connected to the high school and uh, some of the things we talked about at the high school in terms of bus entry and components to the building. Uh, had them looking at the existing plan and ending up with a schematic design that had a lot of similarities to the uh, Southview uh, plan, despite the fact that it's a two-story building. So sixth grade occupy, occupies the upper floor, seventh and eighth grade uh, down below. Our media center uh, provides a learning commons with extended learning environments off of the, the stairwells to the building. Uh, we found that they're already using those in a makeshift manner, pulling chairs out in that area. So it opens up the corners to the building, uh, gives our sixth grade the environment uh, on both sides, and world language occupies the space in the middle. We found a direct uh, correlation to a lot of our French students uh, coming in and that transition to the sixth grade program in this building. Uh, this area to the building, our gyms, our music spaces, like Southview, remain uh, more or less as is. We do have security uh, components at the front of the building as we close down the, uh, the entryway and provide that secure vestibule. Um, our 
seventh and eighth grade are organized on either side of the lower level to the building with our specialist classrooms in the center area. And the entire lower portion to the building here, which has been carved up and subdivided over the years, is going to be reinvented in terms of not only Project Lead the Way, but how they do facts in this area. And looking at uh, facts as really that is project-based learning and how you can incorporate that into maybe some different design curriculum and opportunities. A lot of what we talked about with the groups is the facilities can't drive how you teach. They can only limit what you're able to do in terms of teaching. And so that became sort of a, a discussion point as we worked through with the groups and looked at how the buildings would be organized. I think in the end, the pause that we took uh, not only did it allow us to um, work on the construction documents for the other projects, but in allowing the programming to uh, get a little bit more caught up, it freed up some of the uh, hurdles that the group saw. And when we uh, met with them again to confirm the schematic design, they were very happy with the changes that were made. They found that it actually, some of the things we were struggling with in trying to fit the three clusters together made the building too rigid, and so it provided the flexibility that we were looking for. And I would say that in addition, just as we looked at, you know, when we looked at the scope and the, you know, all the stuff that we're trying to do in terms of adjusting and making sure we're staying on budget, the nice thing was is that having that opportunity to reconvene with them, we were able to sort of make sure that it's staying aligned to that overall budget that we're looking at at all of our projects. Um, and I think, um, to me, the biggest thing that kept coming out in the, in the middle schools, and we often hear this from the community as well, is what are you going to do about those courtyards? And uh, well, we can't do a lot of things <laughs> because of um, state law and code and things, but they are becoming very creative in how they can use those spaces. I mean, we can't just build them into a classroom and you can't just build them in, but how can we <coughs> use them in a way that aligns with state statute and code, um, but doesn't just become this kind of empty space where weeds and things are. So it's a, a building that, a building, um, way that they built buildings a lot in the 60s and 70s and now we just can't use them that same way but um, I think that was what I heard in both Valleyview and Southview when they came in it was like they first had these grand ideas about what we could do with it and then Vaughn would talk to them about what we can what we can't do but uh. we simply reframed how they think about them and in, in terms of it's actually it's another uh, classroom or another space to the building in terms of how code looks at it and so we have to have similar exiting strategies, we have to have similar hardware, and that does impact how you think about how you use the space. Uh, but they became very creative in terms of how we would open up it, maybe extend the learning environments to those areas, how you would gain access to those areas, and how it could support some of the curriculum-based exercises that they have. Um, on, the, on the South View, can you just explain um, maybe a little bit further for the community the rationale for moving the offices and how it'll be an improvement? And then um, in terms of the buses, I know right now buses, I believe, drop off and pick up at two places. They actually well, pick three. up on three sides. Three uh, sides of the uh, due, yeah. to, due to limitations there. And so that became as much of a, no pun intended, a driver. Uh, for it as the fact that um, when we talked with most of the uh, people in the planning groups, they often said, well, first I drove to the parking lot and I couldn't find the front door there. So then I drove to the other parking lot and I couldn't find the front door there. So and then I figured out that it's the, I had to drive up that small hill uh, and uh, there's on-street parking. And so uh, we took a look at both those items as well as <coughs> you really have to think of the East Campus as a campus. There's a lot of activities going on here. And not only do we have issues uh, with Southview, we had issues with how parents at access Normandale. We had early childhood driving issues. And so we're looking mm -hmm. at a parking configuration and a drive configuration that should help clarify uh, all three buildings. And so moving the buses uh, to the north side of the site allows us to come up with a way of having buses only be on one side of the building. It brings our bus students into a new student common space directly inside the front of the building. Uh, and it puts the office uh, on the lower level where we can actually uh, provide a canopy, give a visual cue to bring uh, parents further onto the site so we can reduce the amount of car uh, queue space into the area and it moves things into a, a location that is both secure as well as intuitive. Great, thank you. So Vaughn, I forget how we budgeted this, but is our goal to spend the same amount of dollars or is our goal to have two buildings that are equivalent? The goal is to have two buildings that are equivalent and they have very different challenges as well. Um, simultaneous to uh, the bond referendum work is also the long-term facilities maintenance work that overlaps with this. Uh, there will actually probably be uh, three summers worth of work at both buildings in terms of if you think about it, uh, both from the maintenance projects as well as the bond projects going through. 
Um, we're not necessarily looking at one building as this is a fixed budget, this is a fixed budget, this is a fixed budget. Uh, when we started the design process, as much of a challenge as it was, we wanted to take every building through schematic design simultaneously. So uh, we had lots of meetings where we were backed up one, two, three meetings at night, but it was important for us to look at what the overall goals were for every building in the district so that it wasn't a linear-based process where we would get through phase one and then find, oh, we're short on money, we're gonna have to cut back on what buildings in phase two get. And so it actually provided a way, not only through the design <coughs> process, but the projects we bid to readjust, reevaluate, and make sure that we're moving all of the referenda goals through the buildings uh, as a whole, rather than look at everything as individual buildings. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the middle school schematic design proposal, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next item on the agenda is the public bidding for Concord and Countryside Elementary. Can I get a motion to approve proceeding to public bidding for Concord and Countryside Elementary School projects? So moved. Second. Uh, Margo, do you have a presentation on this? No? No Wait. presentation tonight. It's just the uh, resolution to proceed and then when official bids are re received and we have a recommendation we'll bring that for approval perfect any questions or discussion hearing none all in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed motion carried next item is the preliminary budget for 2016-17 can I get a motion to approve the preliminary budget for 2016-17 so second and Margo, you gave a presentation earlier on this. Do you have anything to add? I do not have anything to add, unless you, I will, but I certainly will answer any questions you have thought of since I presented it. Are there any questions? Additional discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the preliminary budget for 2016, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next item is the Intermediate School District. So can I get a motion to approve the Intermediate School District ISD 287 Long-Term Facility Maintenance Program Budget? So moved. Second. second. Yeah. And anybody gonna cover this? Margo. Yes, as I was discussing er earlier about the long-term facility maintenance changes, one that came into effect last uh, August or last year with the legislative session was the 10-year plan and the changes of how we do that it also impacted 287 so they're required to pass on to their districts their 10-year te um, plan which the local boards are to approve and it also delineates our portion um, that we Edina will be responsible for in 287's um, long-term facility maintenance plan it'll incorporate into our levy so when we're discussing levy in September through December, uh, that will be part of it. It is uh, within a few hundred dollars of what I projected it would be. Uh, and uh, the way they distribute it is uh, on an average, three-year average of our pupil units amongst dip districts. Thank you. Any questions? Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the Intermediate School District ISD 287 Long-Term Facility Maintenance Program Budget, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next is the early education recommendations. Can I get a motion to approve those recommendations? So moved. Second. And we had a presentation on this earlier by Val. Do you have anything more to add on this? No? Are any questions or discussion on this? Hearing none, all in favor of voting to approve the early education recommendations, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next is policy review. We have a number of policies. Can I get a motion to consolidate all of these? So this would be policy 401, 402, 403, 404, 405, 406, 407, 620, and 911 into one motion to approve the revised policies. So moved. Second. Any questions, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of consolidating those policy reviews say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that's carried. Uh, now can I get a motion to approve those policies? So moved. Second. Any questions or discussion? So I actually have one thing 
which is on policy 401, I know we don't deal with the appendix, but the appendix on 401 doesn't match the appendix on 413. And so when we kind of circle back, you might want to take a look at those administ administration deals with appendices as opposed to the board, but just to note that there's language changes in some, but not others. Thank you. Anything else? All in favor of approving policies 401, 402, 403, 404, 405, 406, 407, 620, and 911, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. We're on to information. We have just routine information items, and uh, that would be pretty straightforward. All right. Any committee reports, leadership updates? Hearing none, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>